tonight will uh, start the meeting with a uh, bitter, bittersweet uh, moment. Uh, uh, just uh, in terms, of just uh, we'd like to recognize uh, Dr. Gary Nyan. Uh, very uh, sorry to see him uh, leave us, but uh, also uh, very proud of. of uh, of all you, all the, all that you gave to the district and the children. So, you want to come up to the to sure. your chair and <laughs> give them a round of applause. <laughs> so this is uh, uh, outgoing school committee members. Uh, we present. Uh, uh, district chair. <laughs> it is that one, isn't it? <laughs> so, first, I'd like to thank Chuck for uh, telling me I didn't have to stay for the whole meeting. But I'd like to thank the school committee and, of course, the school administration for this recognition. It's greatly appreciated. I have a few notes here that uh, I want to make sure I don't forget anybody. I'd also like to say that I appreciate the text messages and phone calls that I get from school committee members, can be check-ins to see how I'm doing and also how the school committee is doing. And then um, I'd like to thank Dr. Darby and Dr. King for all the support that they provided my wife, Mary, who teaches third grade over the winter. Um, had a lot of appointments as we learned how to navigate the home dialysis process and uh, their flexibility and their um, Willingness to, to give her support is greatly appreciated. And what else? Oh, and I also have to thank the Chronicle for their support as well. The article that uh, was written by Dave Maroney uh, was seen by a lot of people. Um, I appreciated hearing from a lot of my former students and athletes and their parents and colleagues as well. So, with that, I'd just like to say thanks again. Move. <laughs> I'd like to open it up to the committee if anyone would like to have anything to say. I would like to thank Dr. Nyan for his service to our community for the decades that you've given to our students. And I guess I would like to communicate that I've learned a lot from you about the importance of health education and that I know I'm not the only one in the committee who's going to continue to advocate for that. And every time we do, you're going to be in our heads and our hearts. Right, appreciate that. Yes. I just wanted a chance. I have worked with you a very long time, whether it was in the schools, the Pillars program, the um, writing school notes and learning about what you've done for bullying. Baseball. And <laughs> that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Coaching everything. Um, and I've been impressed and learned so much. Inspired was the word I wanted by you all the way Thank along. You. What you've done for the schools. The, I appreciate that. Going above and beyond. Your your uh, advocacy too. It's great. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I certainly would echo uh, what Jean and Linda said, but also um, you, like many other teachers in the district, have had an indelible impact on uh, my family's life, my children specifically. I um, believe that you were their RISE preschool um, PE teacher. And <laughs> those boys are now 20, 22, and 24. Um, so. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just turned 20, the young, the youngest one. So, um, and I know we've had lots of um, interaction in the community through the Y um, as a great organization that collaborates with our schools and our community and really appreciated all that, that work. And I did, I did see you the other day at the Y, so hopefully we continue to sort of cross paths. You're yeah. probably there more than me. <laughs> well, I think at the time, you always <laughs> there you go. So. Right, the moment you will have that kind of time. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. So you, you know how I feel, Gary. I mean, you. No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
no, similar to Will Elaine, uh, you, you actually were my three oldest phys ed teacher at uh, Barrows, and I think the assistant principal as well. Yeah. They just had a, uh, you know, they have a lot of good memories from from that, uh, and just uh, I appreciated, uh, you know, your insight, and collegiality on the committee. Thanks for enjoy working with you too. Gary, I want to thank you. You, you. you never stopped giving to the community. And for me, I, I didn't get to know you until very late in your school committee career. And I want to thank you for welcoming me as someone who's kind of coming to the whole world of public school education and helping me learn a lot about uh, the, the, the world that we're in here and, and sharing your, you know, your personality, your, your thoughts, you, you know, your, your mentoring to me was, was just really appreciated. You, you keep having an impact on people is what I hear here, and, and you, you kept doing that your entire time here, and I want to thank you for Thanks, Nick. I appreciate your friendship as well, and, and uh, your advocacy is very important on the school committee, so Thank you. Hi, and um, Dr. Nyan, I'm sitting in the chair you sat in, and you left very big shoes to fill, and I hope that I can honor your legacy here on the school committee and thank you so much for all you've done for the district far beyond the school committee but an educator and a principal and like everyone said there are just hundreds if not thousands of people in this community who owe you and your spouse um, a real debt of gratitude thank, thank you, you. It was an honor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, for, for thank you. Uh, for the remainder of the evening, we'll we'll start with public input. Uh, we'll then have the uh, kindergarten presentation, and then the update on the district improvement plan, and we'll, we'll save reports to the end. So, uh, at this time, I would uh, open it up for public input for anything that's not on the agenda tonight. Yes. You come up. So <clears throat> we, uh, go ahead, that's her. Yeah, I've never done this before, so, so <laughs> we so know it's we, scary. We, it's very uh, scary, and to be honest with you, I'm very shy. So, honest. Uh, I, I, we got your email. Okay. Uh, and thank you for that. Uh, I, I will, ha I have to say that that, that that does it is confidential at this point so there's really not m much of anything you, I, I'd like I would want you to say in, in public input uh, uh, you know uh, really other you know just who you are and, and why you're here but I don't want to get into any specifics on that just because of uh, you know, we have to respect the privacy of the situation okay um, I'm and that's not a uh, saying that we're not in dealing with the situation. It's just we can't really talk about it at all. Can on I either side? Really. Oh, okay. So um, I'm Gina Botticelli Miko, and I'm not here to discuss what happened on on Friday. I was just here to discuss what happened to um, to my children. Um, quite frankly, um, but again, you. Uh, yeah. I don't know what it is I can say then. <laughs> if I can, you, because it involves student records, okay. because it, even though it's your child, you can in public session talk about your child, Okay. because um, it would be a violation of student records. So the high school administration has the information. Okay. I believe they have contacted you or they will be con contacting you okay. about uh, addressing the situation. Okay. But we can't. They, you can't. The school committee can't discuss it. They can't hear anything in public about it because it does involve uh, student-specific student information. 
Okay, so I guess I can't say anything. Yeah, and I, I, I do want you to know and to hear that we take your email very seriously, and uh, so by not talking about it isn't 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 a reflection that we don't. So that makes sense. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Chuck, is it not able to say anything if you don't name names? Just the 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 um, whole situation is uh, under review and just not. Uh, I, I it's not the purview of the school committee to hear those types of situations because they're not involved with students. It's, that would be a high school administration situation. And because it involves students and specific students, it can't be discussed in a public session. It's a high school administration issue and they will be addressing it and I believe they've already started. I, I I I understand it's difficult. And I appreciate your understanding. And, uh, as I said, we do take it seriously. Okay, thank you. Right. Any other public input? Okay, I think there's someone else. <coughs> Hi, Hi, Rebecca Lieberman, 50 Pratt Street. I just wanted to express, I sent an email as well, I'm very disappointed that tonight's scheduled math meeting is not happening. Uh, and that there's no clear idea of when it will be rescheduled. Next month will mark the five year anniversary of the rollout of the new math curriculum in which over 75% of Reading Middle School students are, are denied algebra, and that means that they don't have a straight path to calculus for students who might want to study science, engineering, take engineering electives, study math, study physics. Uh, Reading in 2016 ranked 58th out of 62 park districts in the state for access to algebra in middle school. And as our access to algebra has declined, uh, our math achievement scores have declined as well. In 2012, 38% of Reading 8th graders scored advanced on the at MCAS. In 2016, on Park, only 10% of Math 8 students scored advanced in the district overall. And at Parker, only 3% of Math 8 students scored advanced. And what does it mean to ask students who get math more slowly to have to double up in order to do what they want to do? For example, in our own personal experience, my son wants to study physics and was going to be denied that chance. Um, and so I would like to know uh, when we might get that math update, because in addition to the issues with the pathways denying access to algebra for middle schoolers at a rate much higher than other districts, um, we also still have no math curriculum maps for most grades five years into this new curriculum. At a meeting, I believe it, it was the school committee meeting in November, we were promised an update in February. Did that ever happen? Um, and when will we get a report on where we are at with curriculum maps and pacing guides so that all math instruction is on the same page, no matter which school? And also, we need an assessment. Uh, this has been a five-year experiment with a new math curriculum. I haven't seen any evaluation. I mean, I just went on Department of Elementary and Secondary Education website to get these figures, but we need a comprehensive assessment of how this is going, especially in light of the fact that we just combined levels for middle school math and are going to do it uh, in a high school as well. That means that faster paced learners and slower paced learners will be together in the same classes. We need to, before we make any more change, changes we need some evaluation please can um, we get a date to reschedule the math update please so, 
so you know we obviously as you said we set a calendar uh, at the beginning of the year with with when things are going to be on there and you know as due to unforeseen circumstances things come up all the time that need to take precedent over things that were on the calendar we ran into that in the month of January and February and we're trying to catch up with that stuff now and and I think some of of the uh, will be in tonight's presentation correct the district uh, we we do have a partial response to uh, well first of all I believe the response from the committee is in the packet to mrs. Lee <laughs> right. um, which is what I just think, yes, yeah, summary yes. Of what I just so that's that's in here um, <laughs> I know mr. Martin will talk about some things during his report <laughs> on um, and the calendar will be updated right and and as I believe it says in here I, we do not have a date at this time for math presentation and uh, with the fact that we will not have an assistant superintendent on board till July 1 there will not most likely be one for the spring okay can we get just an update on the curriculum maps at, at this time I, we don't have an update thank you thank you Mary Ann Downing, 13 Heather Drive. And I have a, a question that may get covered in the report, so stop me if I, when I get to it, if it's going to be covered in the reports. But just to follow up on something Mrs. Lieberman said, um, relating to the curriculum maps, is it accurate that the high school accreditation requires curriculum maps? Because that's what I had heard from someone on the high school school advisory council. So that I don't have an answer for you okay. at this time. That was something that I heard. So and, and if it is, then that is something that obviously will, will right. have to be part of the process. It is a four-year process. So Yeah. So my just question was just, and again, if this is going to be covered in your reports, I'll stop. Um, How is the assistant superintendent search going? It will be in my report. Okay. Like, that's all. Then I will wait for your report. Thank you. Any other public input? Okay, you want to uh, do the kindergarten? Sure. So, okay. so um, in your packet is a memo um, that is very similar to an email that was sent out to all kindergarten parents via email um, earlier this week. And before, before I begin, I, I want to thank all of the kindergarten parents that reached out to both the school committee and to, to me, um, either through office hours, through email, through phone conversations. I have talked to many kindergarten parents over the last three weeks since our February 26th meeting to hear their concerns about um, what we discussed on February 26th and um, moving forward what uh, what was the possibilities and what we could do so after receiving all of that feedback I what I did is, and in, 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 in conversations I had with the elementary principals and the RISE preschool director, uh, we were able to make some adjustments to what was presented on February 26th. So I want to just highlight that. I know probably everyone in this room has seen it, but I do want to highlight the main points of, of, that, of that plan. Um, so as part of the plan, and uh, we will be offering uh, separate full day and half day kindergarten programs for the 2018-19 school year. Uh, we have been having integrated programs at our schools now for about five years, and the feedback that we have received is that offering integrated kindergarten programs is not an optimal learning environment for students. And ultimately, the decisions we need to make are for in the best interest of the students. All half-day students who have siblings in another elementary school present or past, and I think that's important disti um, distinction, is that there are a few families, a handful of families, but there are a few families that um, may not have siblings in the elementary school next year um, 
or in grade one, but they have had siblings in the past at that school. And where they've built that relationship with that school, we feel it is important to include them in um, any sibling discussion. So any, all half-day students who have siblings in another elementary school, present or past, will be able to return to grade one to the neighborhood school for the 2019-20 school year. Any half-day kindergarten student who has a sibling at a neighborhood school and is on the wait list for full-day kindergarten will be accepted as a tuition-based full-day kindergarten student in the neighborhood school for next year, 2018-19 school year. The only school we could not do this um, at is Wood End, and that's due to the class size constraints. Uh, the class sizes would have been well over the, the 22. Next point. Um, is that in conversations that I had with Joanne King, the principal at Wood End, Rise Preschool Director, Kelly Boswick, Killam Principal Sarah Levesque, all who are here this evening, we're going to move one of the Rise integrated preschool classrooms next year from Wood End to Killam. Um, what this is going to do, it's going to allow us to have an additional classroom space at Wood End. Uh, we do have a classroom space available at Killam to be able to do this. So that additional classroom space at Wood End will be used as a half-day kindergarten um, location. I also want to I also want to emphasize because I know the word integrated is used differently at Rise as it, than it is in kindergarten. Um, Rise is an integrated program. The only exception is we have three sub-separate classrooms, and that is determined by a child's IEP. Um, but aside from that, we have integrated kin uh, we have integrated preschool programs at Rise, and that will continue next year, except for those sub separate classrooms. So I, I want to make sure that 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 that's emphasized because there was some confusion. I know Ms. Boswick, she's here, right? Ms. Boswick got a few emails on that. Um, the Rise program is not changing. Um, the makeup of the Rise program is not changing. So as a result of the, the additional classroom space at Wood End, we're going to be offering half-day kindergarten programs at Killam, Josh Wheaton, and Wood End. Um, as of the date of this memo, all half-day programs will be in the morning. And they will go until, on Wednesdays, they will go till quarter of one, which is something that we have done this year. Um, half-day families had requested that um, this year because they, if they had multiple um, children at the same school, they would actually have to go twice on a Wednesday within a span of an hour to pick up their children. And, and so um, it also gives the half-day students a, an experience for lunch on Wednesdays, um, which they're all currently doing as well. But as a caveat, if the half-day enrollments do go over that 18 to 22, we're going to have to, we may have to rethink that. But as of now, um, all of the half-day programs will be in the morning. The, um, the other piece that I want to um, add in here is that Barrows and Joshua Eaton half-day students are going to attend Joshua Eaton. Birch Meadow half-day students are going to attend either Wood End or Killam, and that's going to be based on geographic proximity. And we will send out new letters to, the, to those half-day uh, parents. Killam half-day students are going to attend Killam, and Wood End half-day students will attend Wood End. All half-day kindergarten programs are going to begin at 8.15, which is an 8.05 entry time, and that's to allow the families who are in multiple schools to um, be able to uh, transport their children. We also are going to have, for those families at Barrows and Birch Meadow uh, who are in half-day that are going um, to one of the other schools, they'll, they'll be able to, at, at no cost, uh, be part of our pre the, um, our extended day program before school starts in the morning, which opens at 7 a.m. each day. Um, and then finally, when next year's kindergarten students are in grade one for the 1920 school year, we're going to review all grade one school assignments and prioritize according to siblings, which will be, as I said already, the siblings will be going back. Um, geographic proximity would be the second piece. Um, and then, um, obviously, the third piece is maintaining the class sizes in that 18 to 22 range. Um, and as I already said, all siblings are going to return to their neighborhood school for the 1920 school year. It is possible, and I know, I know 
people want to know who and and I don't have those answers at this time it is possible that some students that are currently enrolled in full day in one school um, may be relocated to another school um, in grade one um, again that would be based on geographic proximity so if they live closer to another elementary school they may depending on class size they may move um, it will be a very small number of students and it may not be any students at all but it is going to be based on class size um, which is which is something that um, we've been doing for several years now where we have moved the boundaries for um, for any new students coming in the the last the last two pieces I want to which are also in the memo so um, this this does not address everything that was brought up on February 26th nor nor can it um, however through listening um, and talking to people over the last three weeks um, we feel that we have addressed as many of the issues that we can address while maintaining the, the class size piece that we referred to and keeping the half and the full day program separate um, and then the last piece I just want to talk about is you know the, the whole process and and what happened on February 26 and certainly um, you know there was a lot of uh, feedback and input that night in, in that meeting um, and rightfully so there were there were a lot of upset people and you know we can obviously always do things better and certainly we will use this experience um, in moving forward and improving the process and any other process um, you know make it the best process that we can can make it so I think that's everything on the kindergarten piece um, so take any questions yeah I'll open it up to questions I just before I do I'd like to you know thank dr. Dari and the all the staff that was involved for the a lot of analysis that went into this to get it to your point right-sided from from the February 26 meeting I, I know that was it's not it's not exactly perfect but uh, you know it, it certainly weighed and a lot of time was put into it so I appreciate that so, is there any questions yes um, I just wanted to verify that this memo went out to all kindergarten families the emails that we had for each kindergarten family it was sent out to those emails full and half yes okay and Mike the reason I'm asking is if there's the potential that full day kids might be impacted I think yeah every, everyone out. everyone got yeah. the email yes perfect um, and I share your commendation a lot of work and a lot of a lot of analysis clearly when you try to find the best solution possible so I certainly appreciate that and I'd also like to commend the families I've had a lot of conversations and a couple of cups of coffee with a variety of kindergarten parents over the last couple of weeks and I've been so impressed um, I've been really impressed at their willingness to engage with the staff and with the school committee to try to find a good solution. Mm -hmm. um, in many cases, their anger was really justified. And to be able to so quickly begin to process through that and to try to find a solution that works not only for their own children, but all kids, um, I've just been very impressed with this group of parents. So I wanted to extend my gratitude to them clearly being part of the process. Thanks. So I had a question about point six. Can you remember the extended day? Point six, yes. So that's offering, as I understand it, a slot for the for the two schools that will not have half day, Barrows and Birch Meadow. That's offering a slot in the extended day before school programs in the the school that that half day student will be in. Correct. Correct. Have you considered or could we still consider the possibility of allowing parents to select between that one single slot either at the school where their half day child is attending or if they have a sibling and this would only be for sibling groups at, at Birch Meadow or Barrows to have the that slot for their other child so they'd, you'd be in a one different, slot. they'd be in a different school they would but it would be one slot per family for families that are split where you have a half day child being redistricted because of this arrangement and then they have a sibling in a school without half day 
And you're talking about the opposite school where the uh, sibling is at? It would be taking that single sure, we slot. Can, we can certainly it. take a look at that. So if, if we could take a look yeah. at that, some, some parents, yep. just, traffic being what it is in Reading at sure. certain times of the day, parents may have uh, value that flexibility to be able to elect. Which yeah, that's. School. So that's what you're, I just want to make sure I understand. So what you're saying, Nick, is do the. Uh, extend the day in the more you know before school at their uh where their siblings are and then when they get ready to go to class they go to the to the school yes yeah. so so let me put it another way so as it stands now the parent would only be able to use as i read memo point six the parent would only be able to use the before school extended day right. for the kindergartner right and a kindergartner, that's a new environment, and the parent can't accompany them into kindergarten. But they have an older kid who's maybe like, hey, dad, I'm good. See you. I'm in third grade now. You don't have to walk me to the door anymore. I don't need, right? And so that student may be, the, in the parent's view, better suited to the extended day slot, but the kindergartner may, may want extra time with the parent. So just as a caveat, it may be more than one child. Uh, it, it, you know, it, just just to consider that situation for parents and see what you can do. Sure, we we can cer we can certainly look into that. So my proposal would just be a one, just one to one slot, and you can move it to either where your half day kindergarten or kid is going, if you think that's right for you, or you accompany your half day kid to kindergarten, and you use that slot at the older siblings. I understand your point, but if there's more than one child at the ele other elementary school, it's more than one slot. Well, it's multiple. Or, yeah, I mean, you have the raw numbers, so you can actually figure right. out what's feasible. So I appreciate it if you could consider that. That's your point on this. Thanks. Okay. Yes, I'm going to echo what some others said. That I want to thank everyone involved in this process. Um, I feel that as a result of the collaboration between school committee, the administration, um, people who work in the elementary schools, and the parents, that we actually did come up with a synthesis of something better than we had before. And we didn't get stuck either in the old model or the new model that um, was fraught with errors and omissions and um, the solution that's come up actually is the result of parents feedback and parents ideas so as um, you were saying Mrs. Browski and others I think our parents have been a tremendous resource and I thank them for that I really value this kind of collaboration that led to this new model um, this different way of course I think it should have happened at the front end not at the in reaction to the errors and omission and I will expect us to do better in the future and to have that kind of engagement before a decision is made. Um, I also have some concerns for the future because what I saw in this process is we had to balance a number of balls in the air. We had um, on the one hand academic quality which is clearly in the superintendent and the educators purview. We had school committee guidance to balance on class sizes and on um, spot redistricting and we also have established policies on how people get assigned to schools and we were able to balance all of those <coughs> things this time uh, I think in the future we may need to have a discussion about how we may have to prioritize those when they are in conflict with each other for the future because the demand isn't going to go away and the space won't probably won't suddenly grow and I think we're going to have to think ahead so that we're not in a reactive position next so thank you yes um, no, I haven't raised my phone. but I guess I just want to reiterate um, the process is part of what we can learn from mm -hmm. so the collaboration the feedback from the parents um, the rethinking things and going even one step farther to rethink, um, find the switch between Wood End and Killam and the bandwidth for our administration to spend to try to come up with another alternative. Um, I'm really grateful to the administration for doing that, for listening so carefully. I'm grateful for the parents for um, being level-headed, as I said at that meeting, I'm not sure how level-headed I would have been with my first kids going into kindergarten. It's just uh, an emotional process to begin with. Um, 
but I do hope that those conversations continue so that we can learn from each other and we have issues that we need to deal with we do not have enough space it's been on our radar for 10 years and so the compromises I think are getting harder and harder and I think that's part of what we saw this year with the kindergarten solutions and we've seen it in other ways as well when we were waiting for the modulars and talking about that and so going forward um, I don't think those space issues are going to go away right now so we need to keep our tempers and and work together to try to find the best solutions and I'm grateful that this was a little rocky start but I see a future um, in working together on that Thank you. Yes, Nick. so yeah I'm not so sanguine on where things landed um, so I'm not in favor of or against this arrangement. I think it does represent, on the one hand, an effort to address the concerns of those who spoke up, but I don't think it addresses all the concerns that I have. Um, and I would ask that this committee have a future agenda topic, not tonight, but a separate one to, to Sherry's point uh, and, and others about how we're gonna handle um, guidance to the superintendent. Um, we've, we've given the superintendent guidance as a committee about class sizes, and when I thought through um, that, it strikes me that, and just flagging these issues, that the concerns I have with the current arrangement and the concerns I'll have in the future, um, it's like a Rubik's Cube where you're trying to solve six sides at once. Mm -hmm. One side is, is, the, um, is the class sizes, and the superintendent has done an admirable job, not, not an admirable job, not just in kindergarten, but in all grades in, in elementary school, and keeping class sizes low, really a remarkable, difficult thing to do. And so he's optimized that size of the Rubik's Cube, which is what this committee has asked him to do. The point I want to make is that I think this committee needs to update its guidance in light of, of the, the current uh, discussions we had around kindergarten. If we keep having overwhelming percentages of our kindergarten enrollment be full day, and the limited, given the limited space we had, and the fact that we just submitted an override request that did not include a request for, for full day uh, kindergarten funding, which, which would be sizable, um, you know, I, I, I forced to grapple with, this is what I see as the other sides of the Rubik's Cube. I'll just lay them out and then, and then we can move on. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, so the first is that the, the half day arrangement, at any time we have half day kindergarten at not all five sites, not all five local schools, um, I think you put parents and children in a difficult position for the children uh, who, who go to half day in a different school. It forces them uh, to have a second transition. They have to transition into kindergarten at one school. They have to then transition to first grade at another school even under this current policy. So the only way that a parent can, I wouldn't say prevent that, but, may, but make that less likely uh, would, would be to pay a fee, a sizable fee, to access, in my view, their local school uh, by paying for full day. Um, parents build networks in kindergarten, second point. And so parents now have to build a network around a school only to start the following year and build a network around first grade if it's their first child. Third, these user fees are regressive, in my view. They're fixed. Um, other than the very low-income students who uh, I'll, I'm, I'm not addressing at this point, uh, students who don't qualify for national, financial aid, everyone else pays a fixed fee. Um, and I think that's a, a regressive neighborhood access fee, in my view, if you don't have, have half-day K at every school. Uh, so I think we have to have half-day uh, 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 half kindergarten at every school, uh, in my view, for that reason. Um, and lastly, I think that this... Um, uh, this program's on a collision course with itself. Uh, if we continue to have increased proportion of students in full day, what happens when the number of half-day enrollees will only support one classroom in one school? Do we have, by law, I think we have to provide busing if anyone lives more than two miles from that school. Are we going to ask taxpayers to pay for that? Um, I'd rather not. Uh, and lastly, this, this idea of deciding which schools are going to have to have half day and which won't, depending on the enrollment, after parents already enroll in October, is just unneeded unpredictability for, for parents in this district. You have no idea what you're signing up for in October. So those are my great concerns with these. This doesn't address all of them, but uh, it does address some, some of the concerns that were raised. Thank you. So just, be, just to, the, to, to your point, to, to somewhat to Sherry's point, I mean, if I... I don't think the committee's been sitting on its hands on this. We, we oh, only two years ago added 
portables to the district to deal with this issue. I concur with you now. We're at that point again where we need to look at it again, but it's not. We have been looking at this and talking about this for several years now. Uh, it started with the all day kindergarten center, which didn't move forward and then evolved into the portable service. It's modular. actually been since 2010 we've been having so, this discussion. It was the Woburn Street. Uh, and, then, yeah. and so, you know, just it, it, I agree with you. It's something that now needs to be on the agenda. Uh, well, you know, after town we'll do, meeting, or we'll do, yeah, yeah, we'll do it in May or June. figure out what to do about all because because all day kindergarten has now crept up more past than more more past the need that the portables or the modulars uh, satisfy. So we need to look at it again. Yeah. So. yeah, I just don't want people having to pay to access their local neighborhood schools. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there any public? Yes. The kindergarten teachers would like to to read some. We'll see. This was in this was in your packet, I believe. <laughs> so first we'd like to thank the community as a whole, everyone in this room and everybody who's been working on this kindergarten dream. because um, that's what we believe it is. It's a kindergarten dream. Can you, um, I'm sure. I just say so we're, what's Sure, I'm around? sorry. Um, my name is Katie Cole and I teach kindergarten at Killam. Thank you. I'm Ann Manna and I teach kindergarten at Joshua Eaton. I'm Erica Bourne and I teach kindergarten at Killam. Victoria Benz, I teach kindergarten at Killam. So we have put together a letter that's signed and was written with um, all 14 kindergarten teachers. Um, it's in the school committee packet. All signatures are there. So we're here to read that letter and just represent what we as the educators who work with the students, how we feel about this, what we see, um, the educational impact, the professional responsibility that we feel. So we're just going to start by reading that. Sure. As the district kindergarten teachers, we feel we must reiterate the absolute and definitive need for full day and half day program models in the Reading Public Schools. We wholeheartedly support the decision made by Dr. Doherty and the district leadership team. We the teachers reach out to the school committee and the Reading community as the experts in the trenches. As the professionals who are teaching, supporting, observing, guiding, and most of all, loving these young learners in the educational setting. Our number one goal is to, is to support each child in developing as a person. As Dr. Seuss's Lorax once spoke for the trees, we are here to speak for the students. Many of us have had the opportunity to teach all three kindergarten models, half day, full day, and integrated. In teaching these models, we have seen that the full and half day programs are the most effective in supporting our students' social emotional development and in developing foundational academic skills. In the half and full day programs, our students can establish a strong community. They are given the opportunity to interact with each other throughout their entire school day. All are present. This enables students to establish meaningful social and learning relationships. All of their learning and exposures can be connected and presented in a way that integrates learning and makes it most meaningful. Developmentally, the integrated program has proven to be the direct opposite of this. All students are not present. Instruction, learning, and practice is chunked into time blocks that are restricted and not able to be connected. The unplanned learning that takes place naturally in the kindergarten day is not able to be taken advantage of. We recognize that the integrated model allows for interactions and learning to occur. However, because the day is disjointed, it does not provide the same learning opportunities as the half and full day models. Students are constantly switching gears and do not have the chance to dig deep because instructional blocks are divided throughout the day. 
in a time where expectations and standards have become increasingly more rigorous, the integrated program model puts students at a disadvantage. We have done our absolute best to accommodate this model and be mindful of these pieces. However, each day we feel the impact of missed instructional and coaching connections. It's disheartening to feel as though we as teachers are not providing the very best that we can for our students. We recognize that to have the half and full day programs that we know our students need, that siblings may not attend schools together, and that this is upsetting to families and may potentially be inconvenient. However, we must remember what is best for the students socially, academically, and instructionally. As teachers, we assure you that we will work to support all students that are impacted by the potential separation. If the integrated model continues to exist in our district, it will grossly impact class size, as we talked about, and will be going against what the Mass DOE recommends in Chapter 603, 8.01. Kindergarten classes shall not exceed an average of 25. In addition, it will also be against the school committee what the school committee has previously set forth, recommending recommending class sizes of 18 to 22 for grades K to three, a K to third to third grade. If if we continue with an integrated model as of now, class sizes will go up to 23. It is very difficult for teachers to differentiate for all learners with group sizes this big. Additionally, the larger the class, the less frequent the small group teacher-led instruction can take place. Kindergarten teachers feel that this is a crucial component to the academic success for all children. As the 14 current kindergarten teachers, we are unanimously opposed to the integrated model. We continue to urge the school committee and the community to act in the best educational and developmental interest of our students. The decision to have half and full day kindergarten <coughs> programs is what is needed. It supports the development of a learning community. A decision to continue the integrated model will truly limit and put a cap on what kindergartners are able to be exposed to and what they are potentially able to achieve. We want you to know that we are committed to giving your children the best opportunity as they start their educational journey in the Reading Public Schools. Respectfully, the kindergarten teachers of Reading Public Schools. Thank you. And I just want to clarify yes. the class size was K to 2. K to yes. yeah. <coughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So thank you for your time. You. And we know this is not an easy position for community, for family, for school committee, for administration. Um, but this is this is what we know to be true in the classroom. This is what we need for our students. So we appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Any other comments? <clears throat> no slides this time. <laughs> uh, Chad Smith, uh, 71 Locust Street. Thank you uh, to the folks I emailed before, in including that content into the packet. That's, uh, I think that's very important, especially for the full day families around um, to understand exactly uh, the, the, the path that we, all the half day families, at least the previous half day families, were on. Um, and also, thank you also for all of your time. Um, it's pretty amazing getting to know most of you, um, at least uh, over the last few weeks. I'm hopeful that this is my last school committee meeting for a long time, um, but uh, I'll, I'll start off here. So to start, I'm, uh, I'm troubled. I'm troubled by the generated divide between full-day families and half-day families, evidenced by the emails included in the packet for the March 5th, 2018 school committee meeting. In one of the emails, our integrity is attacked, indicating foreknowledge that the integrated program won't be offered and that the half-day won't be offered at every school. I just want to point out that the half-day families are not asking for any kind of special consideration. We're not asking for our own classrooms, just asking for an equal opportunity for our kids. I'm troubled further by another email in that same packet, um, page 32, which states, quote, this seems very unfair to the majority of incoming kindergarten parents who have been told we will not have to worry about the integrated model next year or astronomical class size at some schools. So my question was, when did this correspondence take place when select parents were told that, quote, they wouldn't have to worry about the integrated model? All in all, I feel a lack of transparency and now a generated unnecessary divide in the community. I feel like parents are jockeying for position with their own kids. Again, I'm not up here asking for any kind of special treatment, not a dedicated classroom, just an opportunity to make an informed decision. The 
There is an incredible amount of documented support of the in integrated model available from the superintendent, principals of the elementary schools, teachers of the model, and parents of the students. I appreciate the signed letter and signed statement from the kindergarten teachers expressing their concern over teaching the integrated model, and that's included in the packet. I didn't know that. I didn't know that that's how the teachers felt about it. Although I saw, it, I saw the date, I'm troubled by the timing of the presentation, especially given that this information is provided after the enrollment deadline in mid-December. Has it always been the plan to not provide the integrated model for the 2018-2019 school year? And if so, why was it offered as an alternative plan during the February 26, 2018 school committee meeting? If so, why wasn't this communicated to all parents before the enrollment deadline? I thought we were up against a space constraint issue. Again, no one here is asking for any kind of special treatment, not asking for any kind of preferential treatment, just a fair shot at making the right decision for my family. So mentally, I've moved beyond 2018, 2019. I've come to terms with paying to keep my kids together. But I've got three kids, so let's look into the future. I've got a couple solutions to consider. One I've given already, and that's to offer half-day kindergarten in all the home schools where space is permitted, we can do full day. Another is ask parents what they want. Send out a survey two weeks prior to the initial letters and see what the parents of the kindergartners would prefer. Full-day neighborhood school, half-day neighborhood school, integrated neighborhood school, full-day other school, half-day other school, or integrated other school. You'd have some relevant data to develop your proposed models and could present the results at the information night. Note this would also be a good place to provide some demographically relevant student performance data for the various models. Do the research comparing full-day, half-day, full-day integrated, half-day integrated performance over time. The results of this research could also aid in the decision on providing the program uh, for in the future instead of the opinions, which can obviously change. So regarding the 2019-2020 school year, I think it's important to give the community a sense of balance. Um, let's assume that full day, free full day isn't available for everybody. I think that's safe. Let's say all the current space used for the kindergarten for kindergarten is available. And let's assume a 15-year average plus one standard deviation of 332 kids. Let's not assume anything about the numbers for half-day or full-day enrollment. What do you guys want to see happen? I think it's important for the community to understand what is, what is in your mind, what is the optimal goal? Dr. Doherty, are you willing to tell the community what the plan would be for the following years? And what, what do you see as the optimal situation? So, we're, we're, we, as we had dialogue a few minutes ago, that's something that we're going to take up at a, at a future meeting, but I don't think that uh, we're prepared to talk about that tonight uh, without going through all the different scenarios. Okay. It's too early. Is, is, I'm not going to I'm, I'm, I'm comment. Okay. I'm not going to comment. Is, the, is there a future to... Pl uh, to I'm not going to comment. Integrated. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Can I just say one thing? Um, I'm very conscious of um, my body language, and and I had a wonderful conversation with you and your family, and I know that um, there was a lot of progress made. I just want to clarify that. Um, I get disturbed when there's the assumption of deceit. Like, it, it, I don't think there was any intention to deceive anybody. There was a mistake made, and we're learning, and it's a process. So I just, I just want to say out loud that we're trying to work together, and no one's trying to deceive anybody. Um, and no one was trying to set up anybody for disappointment or anything else. We have constraints, and we're trying to deal with those. And we don't always know what's coming. We don't always know there are sub-separate classrooms or how the numbers are going to fall out. So we're trying to learn and move forward. I, don't, I haven't experienced any deceit in my experience sitting here or um, in my 21 years working with the schools. That's just my 
experience and I just needed to say that because I think that our administrators and our teachers are working together and I actually feel partially responsible because I asked that the kindergarten teachers share their perspectives on this because I wanted to learn straight from them what their perceptions were and I'm really grateful for 14 people to come together to write a letter that's a lot of work um, and to do it in such a beautifully articulate and educationally education way uh, that came out wrong but um, I, I really appreciate that and I wanted to say thank you yes I just, I just think also that we're, we're talking about something that's so far in advance and that's why it's important that we have some follow-up discussions about you know what pieces of our policy are working and what pieces do we need to readdress but I, I also um, you know we're part of what we were talking about was the space constraints um, we've got these two programs they require different amounts of space as was said earlier, we've been working on this since the project that was that was potentially going to be a pre-K and kindergarten center up here on Oakland Road that would have been this amazing center to take. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So we had that. We we looked at Woburn Street. That took probably those took three years, and then we then we finally okay these are not working. We're at a critical juncture, and then we finally got the modulars on the um, three school sites. So I, we have space issues to deal with, but we can't, uh, my personal feeling is we can't really effectively deal with any of those issues until we address our operating issue. And we have a very significant operating issue to deal with next month. And in order for us to keep all the things going on in the classroom that the kindergarten teacher spoke about and the things I hope we're going to hear about in a few minutes on the district improvement plan, we need we need to know that we have stability and sustainability on that. And then we as a committee will fo can and will focus and as an administration, hopefully fully staffed and we'll be able to focus on that. But we've been we've been short a assistant for Mrs. Dowd. Mrs. Wilson doesn't have an assistant. Um, we've all been working as hard as we possibly could. And I, I told someone I have to take a vacation day at work every week because I consume so much of my work day uh, that I take a vacation day even though I am in the plant because this takes so much time. And, 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 and it pales in comparison to the time these folks are putting in. So I just, I do hope that we will have the breathing space to take a big inhale and be able to focus on some of these <coughs> other issues and try to understand where our policies need to be looked at. And, and you know, we, Mr. Bobbin talked about it. Back in October 2016, when we were looking at this, we, we said, we outlined a document that said, here's some of the challenges we're not addressing. Yeah, to pay for, it was a million dollars. Is it a million or a million and a half? It's, it's a million. million. So it's a million dollars million. of additional funding we would need to be able to provide full day K, not, not at tuition uh, for, for all families. And you know that isn't even that isn't even on the table. But I, I'm just hoping we get a chance to to take one at least deep breath, and then we can really look at doing the things that we really need to keep this district moving forward, so that it's good enough for families who move to Reading. So we we will address these issues. And you know, to the point we made earlier, we're not just going to roll into next year without having a discussion, mm -hmm. public discussion about the priorities and how we can try to address them all before we go into the next school year. Sorry. Else? Alicia also has uh, yes. I'll, I'll just, while we're moving around here, um, I want to take thank the 15 people we just heard from, so the 14 school teachers and Mr. Smith. Um, among the things I took away from that that I'd like to specifically discuss when we have an agenda item and some space to discuss this later as a committee. Um, one, I'd like to talk about the integrated versus the full day because 
to Mr. Smith's point, I, I, I think there's a, a variety of different, if you look back on the school committee minutes over the years, and, and I did as well, there's a variety of different views on that. And so we should have a discussion about what's best for, for, you know, for providing guidance to the superintendent, what we want to provide guidance on, and what we want to leave to his discretion. Secondly, I, I like Mr. Smith's point about looking at some of the statistics. Um, I think, in my view, I, I came to the view looking at this that if you look at just our budget book, there's some nice tables that have been put together that have all the enrollments going back 17 years. To me, it's it's pretty clear that you know, Mr. Smith mentioned, I think, two standard deviations or standard deviation around a median. These We can have a statistical discussion, and I'm happy to, to have that at the right time, but um, I think that there are, are clear planning scenarios that it's fair to address. And Mr. Smith, was your number 332? Yeah, uh, 332 is yeah. one standard deviation. Yeah. So, so take a 332 number and, and being able to have time for us to prepare for a, a discussion about well, what would that look like? That's a reasonable thing to, to, to use as a, um, a focal point in our discussion. Not that we would tell the superintendent what to do with that number. That's not our role. But we need to provide three-dimensional guidance. We need to account for all these sides of the Rubik's Cube and provide the superintendent with updated guidance. I think having a scenario plan like Mr. Smith suggested it would be helpful. So let's Great. let's learn from what we've heard and, and have another discussion. Thank you. Hi. Oh, Alicia Williams, can you guys hear me? I'm sorry. Um, just really quick comments for you. Um, I just want to make sure that the committee is aware that transitions are real with little children. I have a five-year-old, I have a three-year-old, I have an eight-year-old, and and I had a transition from rise to kindergarten with my eight-year-old and if any of you would ever like to hear that story I am happy to share it it takes four hours to tell um, I also think that um, the committee might need to look at the 18 to 22 guideline as Reading explodes and as we become a place that people want to live that we need to we need to to look at that guideline and maybe it's 18 to 23 one more student maybe that will help um, I had a question for the superintendent. Um, why kill him and not Joshua Eaton for Rise? I don't have an additional classroom at Joshua Eaton. I thought there was an extra one. There's no. not? Okay. Um, and then I had another thought that nobody's brought forward, and I don't see the school committee doing often, which is um, subcommittees. It might be in our best interest to form a kindergarten subcommittee and a space committee and have parents involved in those processes, processes rather. Um, I haven't heard anyone mention it, and I just think it might give a different perspective of what parents want, and maybe they can help facilitate Chad's idea of a survey. Um, so I hope the committee will think about doing If that. I could just comment, we, we actually did have a space committee. Yeah. Right, um, but that was different, wasn't it? No, no. It, was no, it wasn't. <laughs> it was actually to look at this very topic. Okay. Maybe it needs to be revisited. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it needs to be revisited. I don't know. I mean, I did know there was a space committee, but I thought it was due to the, the early education childhood center that they it, it looked at all of this. It right. looked yeah. at the whole thing. Right. So, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Um, my name is Michelle Sanfi, and I actually was a member of the space committee. Um, so just to speak to that space committee, it did look at the entire space issue in the Reading Public Schools at the time. We also had the opportunity to go in and to um, do a walkthrough of the schools that had the biggest space constraints at the time. Um, it was comprised of business members, parents, um, I would say the size of it was probably about 14 people. Yeah, a member of the Board of Selectmen on there. Yes, we had a member of the Board of Selectmen. So um, I, I do feel like this issue has been um, looked at. Um, I feel like our budget constraints have become so monumental that they have really kind of sucked the energy out of everybody, the educators, the parents, the school committee. Um, our administrators, our paraeducators. Um, I would ask you, when you do go back and have your discussion, to please not increase the guidelines because that would fly in the face of what is in the best interest of all of our students. Thank you. Yes. Um, I just have a comment um, after Mr. Bobbin's comments. Um, about what's best. There's no doubt that we need data 
um, to support our decision making and inform our decisions. But I believe that I I heard tonight from the four elementary print uh, sorry kindergarten teachers who represented the 14 mm -hmm. what's best and I'm quite sure that if we need data evidence data and evidence will we'll we'll get that but I really want to <coughs> say that I I, I don't want to thank the teachers again for the work that they did thank you, thank you. yes Taylor, <coughs> Taylor Burns, 16 Collins F. Um, first, I just wanted to thank everyone in this room for, for taking a look at this issue. I realize there are no easy answers here, but there's a lot of difficult things to deal with. And I won't reiterate, and teachers also for their, their input as well as teaching our children. So thank you. And the administration as well. So I won't reiterate, I agree with a lot of the points, and I, I'm glad you guys are doing that as a group think about how to like provide better guidance going forward or clear guidance. One thing I would add to that is really think through how this gets communicated out. I think one of the challenges now mm -hmm. is that we don't get a clear view of the half day and full day preference. And so it just compounds the issue in terms of people have a, a, a fear or need to hold their spot in full day to walk in that school. And then there are no clear numbers to be able to do what is already a multifaceted and complicated process. Mm -hmm. And so as we think through what that guidance is, how we communicate that out to the parents before they make that selection, in terms of saying, like it's, if you said, if your siblings, it's not an impact to your home school of the future. If you select full day, that's not a guarantee into your, uh, into your home school, because depending on class sizes, you may get pushed. And so to the extent that we can think through that and then build a communica communication plan around that, I think it'll, it'll at least take one less variable out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. And thank you to the staff. And we're going to want to take a final break. Yeah, we'll yeah. take a two-minute recess. Two-minute recess. And we'll reconvene and we'll do the history. Thank you.
So, um, it, in your packet uh, is the original district improvement plan that you approved in uh, November. Uh, earlier this evening, I sent to the committee the um, presentation, uh, which there are, I believe, copies around somewhere, um, which will be in the final posted packet. Um, I do want to thank all of the staff that is here this evening, administrators, um, our, our data coach, um, for, for being here to give you an update on the district improvement plan. What you're going to hear this evening is how each school is addressing the needs of the district improvement plan through the lens of their school and their school improvement plan. So you are going to hear, the only school you're really not going to hear from tonight is Joshua Eaton because you just heard from Joshua Eaton. But Lisa Marie is going to talk tonight. She's going to, she's going to do the introduction. Um, <laughs> um, but similar to what you heard about Joshua Eaton, you're going to hear about um, the great things that are going on in our schools. Uh, and I, I want to thank, I want to thank the staff, I want to thank the principals, the teachers, um, educators for all of their hard work obviously this has been a very challenging year with everything that's been going on um, and our staff has not wavered in their commitment to children and you're going to hear tonight how each school is addressing the needs based on what the data is informing them so I'm going to very quickly um, go through the first few slides and then I'm going to turn it over to Courtney Fogarty our data coach who's going to do um, a few slides on, and you've seen some of these slides before about the, the way we use data in the process. So here's our district goal. Um, we are in the second year of this district goal. Uh, and the, really the focus is on the multi-tiered system of support and how we're addressing the needs of all students. We have five focus areas, four of them, are focused on the students. The fifth one, which is uh, the communication piece, is embedded throughout all of them. So you've seen these before, closing the achievement gap, literacy, mathematics practices, social emotional learning, and then uh, communication. There are several projects that we have been prioritizing based on these focus areas, and again, I'm not going to read these. These are for your information. Um, at the elementary level, the bulk of the work has been on writing across the curriculum. Um, there's been a lot of training and focus in this area. Uh, in science, we're in year two. Uh, and the implementation really has been focused more on uh, the high school this year, uh, particularly in grades nine and 10, um, with continued implementation in grades three through eight. You'll also hear from our middle school uh, administrators tonight talking about advisory and how that's uh, been addressing focus area D, which is social emotional learning. Um, there's been some level consolidation work going on at both the middle and the high school. And I know that Mr. Barker is gonna talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> there's a review of our special education language-based program and I know um, Mrs. Wilson's gonna talk about that. 
and the school climate survey, uh, which is focus area E, that is going to be administered in May, um, May and June, um, to all students in grades 6 through 12, all parents, and all teachers in the district. There are several professional development activities that have been aligned with our district improvement plan. What I've done is I've put the focus areas um, aligning with. So again, I'm not going to read through these, but you can see how each of the professional development activities that have been going on um, are aligned with specific areas in our district improvement plan, but different focus areas. A lot of them are under the guise of A, which is closing the achievement gap, and something else. Um, because if you're addressing literacy, you are closing the achievement gap. If you're addressing math, you are closing the achievement gap. Same with social emotional learning. And here are some additional ones. You can see the, uh, this is a pre-K to 12 plan that we've been working on this year. So there are some activities going on at RISE. Um, as well. We also have had some, some larger professional development activities, such as the NPEN, which happened in November, which was a regional professional development series of activities. Um, it was on the voting day um, in November. Uh, we had a STEM Institute here hosted um, earlier in the year, and that um, it focused on uh, next generation science standards. We've had math perspectives training in pre-K and K-2. to um, We've had some health curriculum work being done um, in grades 3 through 12 with, with our uh, health education staff. Uh, some things going on at the high school include keys to literacy and engaging schools, which I know Mr. Barker is going to talk about a little bit in detail. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Courtney, and she's going to talk about how the We've been using the data to inform what each school has been focusing on. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, I'm Courtney. I'm the district data coach here in Reading. Um, and I work with preschool through grade 12. And what I do is I mostly support the adults, whether it's administrators or teacher leaders and building leadership teams, uh, and feeling more comfortable with data conversations and getting with a focus mostly on the conversation turning into action. Uh, so they don't have to do the digging. I don't want their time spent in the Excel sheets. I don't want their time spent in the, the raw numbers. Uh, we try to work together to find the best ways to show them uh, visually to their whole staff and work from there so that they can have active conversations on what to do next. Because that's the important part, and that's what uh, you guys do best. So that's what I want them to be able to do. So usually um, I help them with the data to decide kind of what the cycle of improvement might look like or what trainings might be needed to be there. Because I'm also the director of the School Climate Transformation Group taking over after Sarah Bird transitioned to Arlington. Um, so I handle a lot of working with the behavior, behavioral health coach as well. So this is from uh, MTSS and PBIS, which you might have seen before. Um, so outcomes being the final step is what drives your cycle of improvement. What happened last, whether it's the last test, the last survey, uh, so to speak. So say the outcomes of the YRBS survey. They showed that a lot of our students were anxious. Our students were looking at re reporting uh, use of substances, those kind of things. What data? goes along with that. It was things like which student, how many, what kinds are more likely to, like when you compare subgroups. Uh, what practices as adults uh, can we put in place to address that? What practices do we not have and we need to send people to get trained in? Restorative justice is one of the things that we've been working on because uh, we wanted to go in that direction. Um, and systems. How are the adults set up, so to speak? How are the things in place around our district, whether it's time, time is part of the system, um, physical resource, buildings, those kind of things. How are those set up to allow us to look at the practices and data? So that's kind of where we start those cycles of improvement. Um, it all comes out of the outcome, whatever is your last outcome. And I do that with Assessments as well, there's usually more with MCSS based stuff on um, building your tier one, tier two, and tier three, and the interventions in each of those levels. 
Um, and so to give you a, a little refresher of something that we looked at in the fall, it's um, how, like what kind of data, who's looking at it, um, and what's done with each kind. Uh, because outcomes call, come in all different shapes and sizes, right? So the aggregate level being, we take MCAS for example, aggregate being your, the number that exceeded or proportion that exceeded were proficient or not proficient. This aggregate would start to take it into subgroups. <coughs> strand, you'd start to take it to the curriculum side, strand matching up with subgroups, uh, who, which group performed how well and what kinds of items. Um, then taking it to the actual items, but think looking at question type and where the question was in the test, as you might imagine, uh, on long tests, questions at the end might not get as much attention as uh, questions at the beginning. So we start to take into account those kind of things. Um, and student work and staff voice, how do they feel on a certain test, or what, is, what do they feel that these things mean to them? What do these results mean to them? Those are kind of the basic five levels, and this isn't any data set. I walked you through these five levels with the um, DCA at the, at the beginning of this year, and that's just another example. Um, what happens at each level is just kind of a, an overall view of what we do with each of those types of data, because it's my firm belief that not everybody should have to sit through all of that. Everyone is welcome at every level. But the level of detail is not, I don't want to burden people's already very full schedules if they don't need to look at the raw spreadsheet, basically. Um, but if they want to, they're absolutely welcome. Um, and so from the aggregate level, looking at the overall outcomes, then to drawing critical comparisons between groups, uh, collaboratively exploring implications of those critical comparisons, and that's when you start to get in the bigger group. You get the people who are boots on the ground involved because I want their perspective. They're the ones who do the teaching. They're the ones who work with our kids. Uh, that's why I want the adults to feel comfortable and confident with data because they make the connections with kids, which I think are so important uh, and really enhance the data. Like, they are the be all end all, not the numbers. Um, and then going into the items, kind of what's in our control, what can make the biggest impact, and how do we know if we're getting the outcome we want. This really includes formative assessments when you're in between those outcomes, right, those benchmarks. And who's at the table? Again, anyone is welcome at any level. This is just kind of how it's set up because that's at the top of the pyramid, not because it's the most important. It's actually one of the least important. It's student work, staff voice, and those item and curriculum strands that are really the most important. They're the foundation for what the outcome is. Um, and I want the most important eyes on the most important information. So my goal is to uh, help them feel confident in looking at it and discussing it like how in the context of their practice so they don't have to feel like a statistician. So again, if they want to, they're welcome to. <laughs> um, so at the beginning of the year, uh, when I walked through the DCA, I showed you our real results and our real areas of weakness. One of them being, um, and I'll paraphrase here because I don't have the word structure in front of me, but um, it was along the lines <coughs> of not having a clear process of how to go through data, right? So that's where I said, I need to fix that. I need to work on that for those results. So, uh, at the beginning of the year, with all the building leadership team uh, leaders, so the administrators and the teacher leaders from each of those groups, um, we went over the five basic steps of inquiries from Nancy Love's data guide to data coach um, coaching, and have this kind of five-step blueprint on how to have a data conversation. So we had, and you'll see the schedule of the data meetings, the, the district-wide data meetings in a moment. But the focus was to build capacity on knowing how to take it from the spreadsheet or even a bar graph and work it all the way into discussion and then action. So first we worked with small groups and worked with each other on how to have this conversation with each other. And the goal was to expand that. How do you have these conversations with your entire staff? How do you walk them through? How do you ground them where they need to be grounded? Why are you looking at this? And why are you looking at this right now? Go visual, show them the information. Don't hide anything. They're, they're part of it, they're part of the outcomes. They deserve to see everything. Um, 
observe. I like to split these in two because you really need to take time to observe the actual data and have time, I think, to have personal one-on-one -on -one think time with yourself and what you're seeing. And then going into questioning and inferring. You'll notice that discussing and questioning and inferring are two different sections too. Because I think you need to take the time to push the boundaries of your thinking when you're looking at this information, um, usually with other people. And then discussion really comes down to uh, when you're trying to take it into action in your context, whatever that may be. So these are the five areas, and as plenty of the administrators can attest to, uh, I usually send it in a graphic organizer, and you can make up, you get to design whatever part uh, you need, but I make sure you know you always have to have all five um, and I really am firm about that um, and there's usually protocols in here and here so there's really structured qualitative information gathering because that's really important to me to capture and then view the words of your peers um, this is the kind of data that they use in between those outcomes right um, this is what we use to as teams to determine intervention needs, training needs, as it relates to often PBIS and um, PBMPSS structure. This is also a refresher from the fall. Um, I'm pretty sure that has all the same things. I'm not sure anything was added, but uh, this is guidance from Desi. Uh, um, prefers you to use the ABC model. That's what they create their EWIS off of as well, the early warning indicator system. Um, and they recommend using attendance behavior and course performance for your indicators in between your biggest outcomes. Uh, what you use in those ABCs is up to you, and this is, not every team uses all of these, that would be really difficult to move into action, but um, we do use these, and uh, different groups use different amounts. Okay, so again, following some of the results of the DCA, there was, uh, to paraphrase, one of the other areas of weakness that we had at the end of last year, the building leadership teams reported that they did not feel there was enough guidance from the district leadership team on how the data for MTSS was being used. So we created a process, that kind of five-step blueprint that you always use for having a data discussion. And then we also modeled every step uh, and had uh, data workshops where district members, so all the administration attended, um, all the building administrators attended, and also their building leadership um, teacher leaders. I know that's a lot, there's a lot of leadership in that. <laughs> they are the leaders of the leaders. Um, and so, as you can see, we made it through about three-fifths of the way. We, um, completed each of these workshops. And I have pretty detailed agendas of each of them, but I'll just give you an idea. They're based around the data-wise process. So it's kind of braiding in all the, which is out of Harvard. Uh, I also think I showed that one before. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorites. Um, so we're trying to braid together all the best practices that we have um, to have these conversations. So the first one, really focused on data meeting design, and they got to see their demographics of who's coming in from the October Sims data that's collected. Um, and so we worked on practicing those five steps and how to design a meeting with protocols. By the second one, we had had some information, mostly qualitative, about a problem of practice and a student learning problem. So we discussed the difference between those two things. That's a main concept of data-wise. Um, and we discussed those, one being a problem of practice being uh, how do you use intervention blocks most uh, purposefully in our days because we just added them at the beginning of the year for every school. And then the student learning problem being um, the widespread anxiety. So we had teams break up with different levels and different buildings to practice that. And again, walk through that five step and really model it with problems that we're actually experiencing. So, and then the third one was share outs where they shared where their building leadership teams were on their goals. Um, we got to see a lot of successes. Um, and we spoke about barriers too, because we're, we're going to address that again in May and think about what we want to change for the next year. And then the, that DCA I was talking about happens in June. And so now we're going to move, over, move on to the secondary. You're going to hear some of the examples from the individual schools. 
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Mm -hmm. There's three of us. <laughs> so we're excited to be presenting together as a unified secondary level tonight. Um, when we were planning for this, we um, were excited to be sharing many different ideas that we wanted to share with you tonight. And we decided we really needed to hone in because we were told it really should just be a snapshot. So we hope we give you a little bit of a snapshot of what's happening in our buildings. And we chose three general areas that we feel are aligned across the secondary levels. That will be our areas of focus tonight. Um, one is the development of intervention opportunities, as Courtney mentioned, is new for all of us this year. Um, our ongoing efforts in the social-emotional support for all of our secondary students. And as administrators, our ongoing efforts to build our staff capacity since they are the ones that our teachers are the ones who are working directly with our students. And we definitely want them to feel um, empowered to do to give the students what they need. So those are our common areas that we will be talking about tonight and then sharing some specific examples. And we'll start with intervention. Thanks, Sarah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, start just first talking about intervention opportunities at the high school. Uh, kind of coming in four years ago, one of the greatest issues around intervention at all levels, I think, is time. Uh, so we looked very closely as a leadership team at the, the building schedule, trying to find time to really maximize that, which is one of the greatest challenges at the high school level uh, due to the schedule. Uh, so many of you know, we, we did uh, come up with a couple of different places for time. Uh, our office hours, which is a delayed opening on Tuesdays, about 30 minutes. And then every Thursday, something we call Flex Block, which is essentially a directed study that we use for a number of different things. So that first year, uh, we really used that to just get extra help, finish exams, uh, work with counselors in some cases, really a tier one intervention that was available to all students uh, with a lot of success. The biggest challenge was in some cases, you know, you had math teachers with long lines of kids, which was great, but how to sort of support that bandwidth and do it the right way uh, so that all kids had access to that. So learning how to use that time the best of our ability was, was certainly a goal. Uh, so the second year, we tried to really narrow that focus a little bit better. And uh, it kind of dovetailed with the issue around level consolidation and wanted to make sure we hit the ground running. Uh, so we did identify a group of kids uh, that we really had great concerns with to prioritize that and sort of identified tier two and tier three, both academic and social emotional supports uh, in, that, in that second year of this current school year. Uh, and so far, that's been a real good success. We've identified a few teachers can, uh, jointly with our teacher leaders who are facilitating uh, kind of study support groups. Some of them have a focus in executive functioning. Uh, we've used kind of a screener to try and better understand what those common themes are, issues that kids are having. Uh, other students, it's more social emotional issues. We're looking with the social workers and breaking them into groups to try and give uh, some of those tier two interventions and supports. And then heading into next school year, trying to figure out how to really make the most of that office hour time. So the second half of this school year, uh, we're using our office hours really to try and bulk up our SST process so that all teachers can join in that meeting time. Uh, for a long time, it's been whoever can attend within a busy schedule, and it's really kind of cheating ourselves with teachers who have great success with certain kids and working jointly with teachers who are struggling with, with a certain student. So uh, during that Tuesday time, we're now actually having our SST meetings for those really, really struggling kids that all teachers can attend. In some cases, we have the student attend. In some uh, cases, we have the, uh, the parent attend as well. But really, so you have a team approach to, to helping those students. Uh, so that's kind of our goal with the second year. And then using data, as Courtney mentioned, uh, by actually using the report card to identify if the teacher has a student, let's say, that gets a D or an F, to really identify two or three comments specifically that are areas that they're struggling so that we're not wasting a lot of time in that first meeting trying to figure out and diagnose uh, what's happening. But that data will come right from the report card and then we can disaggregate at the first meeting. So. Um, and at Parker, we have two different types of intervention opportunities. So we have based on our long-term data so our quarterly data meetings we have and data coming in when kids are coming into the grade level at the beginning of the year we do hard schedule students for um, reading um, reading intervention and math enrichment so those are those are more long term we also this year have implemented teachers can request um, in order to 
um, work with students on short-term skills so they can request time with students um, showing entrance criteria that they need um, help or intervention on a specific skill or two specific skills. So that's something that's short-term, they can get, can get done quickly, more in the moment based on formative assessments or um, criteria that they've they've come forward with and are, are asking and requesting that time with the students. So that's, that's something new. That is quite a bit different than our more long-term interventions, which are quarterly based. Um, and at Coolidge, we're very similar to Parker. Um, we pride ourselves in being very aligned in things, yet our schedules are different a little bit, so we do things look a little bit different. Um, this all generated last year. We did a lot of work on interventions, and we discovered that we didn't have much time in our schedule for just some tier two interventions for the general education population. So um, at Coolidge, we also have uh, reading and math that can be hard scheduled in to like an enrichment period or other times during the day. And we developed this year uh, two times a week what we call a what I need block. And that's where we are giving some students more of that individualized or small group instruction surrounding math. Um, and we also are working on some executive functioning needs that were identified as a need for many of our kids. And we're also testing out a mindfulness group in sixth grade. Um, and when those students are getting those smaller group interventions, um, those who don't need the smaller group are still working on organizational needs and are actually spending time reading one day at college. So it looks a little different and we're both trying to um, fulfill the same the same ultimate goal um, through different routes, but similar. So we're excited about that. And then next, and then going into next year, um, as our schedule schedules may be changing slightly next year, so we are looking at what it's going to look like in our schedules for next year because it, it um, potentially, I know Parker wouldn't look the same regardless, just because we want to make it more accessible and um, more consistent across the board. And also something that has come up a lot this year, especially with the way that we're doing the in the moment um, or short term skills based intervention um, is that teachers need more training on entrance and exit criteria. That's not something that's easily done. It's something that has kind of hindered our process a little bit this year and we're learning from that. So in the moment when teachers say, when we're sitting in a data meeting or just a general team um, team meeting and we're talking about what students need, they, um, and then I say, well, what's the evidence of that? So what, you know, and what specific skill is that that they need and, and they need before you can move on to something else. And when we, before we talk about making that plan, that short-term plan, we need to see the evidence of that. So that's been, um, been something that takes quite a bit of work in the moment. And so I feel like if they can all make it all, um, instead of doing it in the moment when it's needed, if everybody has training on that, it would make it much more efficient. Mm -hmm. And then just shifting gears to social, specific social emotional learning at the high school. Uh, the second year of our sort of some of our guidance with our department practices using flex block really that was another driver for that is is really giving kids more individual time with their guidance counselor uh, so this year there's been a net increase of three meetings for every student at a minimum so right now we're actually in the middle of scheduling process working hard uh, really sitting down with every student and trying to understand what the kids interests are what the students likes are what the students have really uh, done so far to make sure that they're on the right track uh, for graduation and beyond. Uh, specifically, the topics that they're working each grade level, ninth grade is that all important transitional year. Uh, tenth grade is career exploration as they sort of begin to figure out you know, what are their interests, what are their long-term plans. Eleventh grade, more specific post-secondary planning. And then that final year is post-secondary planning kind of continuing, but also the application process. Uh, just to help students with that sometimes overwhelming uh, process. So this year, again, a little bit more specific in the topics. The counselors have had a chance to put together more curriculum uh, and just are able to get in more depth with more time as a result of that flex block. Specifically around uh, PBIS, we've really tried to, to find ways to take what's worked well in middle schools and elementary schools and acknowledging positive behavior, setting good examples, being clear with what we want to see uh, across the school, and have had a lot of success with students of the month recognition tied to our, our core values. 
uh, and that's been that's been very well received. We rotate each month. It's a new core value, so very similar to the other schools. And then at the end of the year, culminates in a, in a um, underclassman awards as well as our senior awards, where we recognize each of those core value awards as well. Uh, and last year was a good, was a great success. We also identified a teacher at the end of uh, the school year that exemplified those four core values. In an effort to make sure that we're also modeling for students, you know, what we ask them uh, to do as well. And then the, the last thing that FlexBlock really helps with the social emotional uh, work is enrichment. Uh, so we've offered a number of programs this year. Last year we, we had a few, but this year really tried to be more purposeful uh, in some of that work. So most recently uh, in January, actually, we had Dr. Ann Hornstein speak to the students in ninth and tenth grade, uh, jointly with our a world of different students who were, who were recently trained. And uh, she will also be speaking to 11th and 12th graders later this year. Uh, we also have worked with, uh, working with our CASA on a one play, a one person play, I should say, called Alex's Story to talk about addiction, overcoming an addiction, addiction issues, and a Q&A to follow with the students in 11th and 12th grade. Uh, and then lastly, we have a uh, production of To Kill a Mockingbird, which is kind of promoting the theme of social justice with the 9th and 10th grade students, followed by a Q&A. So it'll be a nice chance for the kids to do that. And then probably the most important thing that is a little bit more intangible is just trying to promote student voice as we looked at policies and programs uh, and different things in the school that you know were causing students stress and anxiety. Uh, so talking about graduation requirements, talking about what homework is, talking about grading policies, and helping students to really feel like they have a voice in that. So meeting regularly with student leadership, uh, talking to kids about what's working and what's not, uh, and being able to give that feedback has been a really important part of uh, working on social emotional learning at the high school. Um, at the middle school, I know you're all aware that we have started a new advisory program this year that we're very excited about. We worked really hard on that over the last year prior to the school year um, to prepare ourselves. And a little bit about advisory, as I know most of you already know, but the ultimate goal of advisory is to build a community and for students to feel as if they are part of something, and we know how important that is at all levels. Um, the advisory space, which has a smaller ratio of students to an adult, allows students the opportunity not just to get to know an adult better and that adult the student, but for students to also build a connection with each other so that they then can have a safe place for discussions surrounding empathy and understanding and identity. Um, and we were excited to have support from our district grant this year, the Social Emotional Grant. Um, to be working with Facing History and Ourselves, not just the organization, but to have access to curriculum. And they helped us to um, develop some advisory sessions, which we've been using throughout the fall. Um, and these, you know, the focus areas for these sessions have focused much on identity, and then not just individual identity, but then student identity in different settings, such as community, um, labeling each other, how we identify ourselves, how we might judge others, um, and then what that means to be a part of a group, and um, kind of the we and they idea, and kind of breaking down those barriers. So it's been very exciting, um, and we've learned a lot about our students and ourselves. Um, but we haven't limited ourselves to that curriculum. We really use that as a resource, and we've used the advisory time to really take pause when we need to to address community events or issues such as we did a whole unit on hate symbols when that was something that kind of arose in both middle schools that we really wanted to take seriously. Um, when Anna Orenstein was coming to visit, we um, did a lot of preparatory work with the students to help them prepare for her um, assembly. And as things come along, either in our separate schools or in our community or just that we think students are in need of, it's a wonderful place to be able to have those safe discussions um, so that we are building community members who are aware and involved and connected. So, um, more on advice. Oh, there's a picture of what, a, yeah, with Ms. Merrill and her sixth grade advisory. Typically, the kids in advisory sit in some, you know, sit in a circle or semicircle or, um, you know, a, a one group in the middle of the classroom. So we also, both schools, um, January and February, we did kind of, not take pause, but 
really wanted to, since we spent so much time on advisory with professional development and training and everything this year, and put so much into this, into um, having teachers become more comfortable with using case history, we wanted to make sure that we evaluated how it's going. So we did, um, we did the same um, survey with, um, and we did a survey with students and a survey with the teachers. And then um, we're able to take a look at the data. Sarah and I actually talked after we both um, took a look at our own and kind of analyzed our own and then realize we have a lot of commonalities. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting. So the, um, as you can see up here, some of, the, some of the feedback, students are feeling happy but increasingly stressed, which is kind of interesting. We had similar percentages of kids feeling happy. Um, pretty much regularly, about 70% of our students in each grade level were feeling happy. Um, we did the surveys by grade level so that we could look at where what the points were the kids and the teachers were more focused on by grade level, not by school. Um, because of different needs, obviously, at sixth grade versus eighth grade and so on. But something that Sarah had said, where we, we take time to focus on things that come up, such as the eight symbols and things like that. That was something that came up in, and I know the Parker surveys was that students appreciated that. They said they liked that. They felt very connected with their group when they had, and their teacher when they had opportunities to talk about those things and and felt good about that. So um, our we've had we have um, a different structure. We put the same we have the same amount of time allocated at both schools for the advisory program. So so we've done um, the same facing history lessons. Um, both schools have covered those same lessons. Um, we have provided the teachers with very structured materials this year so that they can become more comfortable. We've um, had professional development on, on um, being taught those actual, some of those actual lessons so the teachers could be the students in those cases and see what the students would feel like. And um, that, that is um, a part of why we feel like this is, it has been successful, but the teachers are, um, have communicated with us through the survey that that it's super structured, so they'd like some opportunity for, and I think this came up at both schools, was that they'd like more, um, more toolkit type um, work to be done. So looking at themes that have come up, so the themes were pretty um, consistent with the students and the teachers as well, about things that we are looking at um, in the future, reducing stress and anxiety, building empathy, which is, which is continual. Um, building connections and teamwork, and also trying to focus on transitions. So those are things that we are looking to, over the summer, have teachers um, from both schools at each grade level come together and do some work on those <coughs> building toolkits for teachers on those themes so that then teachers don't feel so restricted to have to do this activity, this activity, this activity, and get it done in three advisory blocks. They'll have, um, options as far as what their group specifically needs and the type of activities that might better suit their group. So that's a flexibility that the teachers would greatly appreciate. So, And now that we have the Facing History Connection too, we have access to all their resources, which is just so deep um, that we need time too to continue to pull from that resource as part of the toolkit so that we create grade level themes and that we're utilizing both facing history and other things that we feel is useful. So since we, um, we've we gotten a lot of guidance from Dustin, who's the person that we work with through facing history, and he actually pulled things that he thought were more middle school appropriate. Now that we're more familiar with it, we can go in and start pulling things ourselves, ourselves and um, be more comfortable doing so. And there's a lot of material there. Um, uh, shifting to capacity building, um, the biggest issue kind of around the closing and achieving gap that the high school's been uh, challenged with is the consolidated level. So uh, we know the, the implementation was less than ideal, but we're not really having to, to make that uh, jump with the, the budget issues and then also just issues around compliance with high numbers of special education students in our CP courses. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we set aside some funds in our, from our operating budget for the uh, this year, and we're working hard to find the right partner 
uh, to support us in, in multiple ways and wanted to make sure we first kind of hit the ground running as I mentioned before we did identify the kids who are most concerned within that level consolidation and then sought feedback from staff uh, early on to see what some of the issues were. So quickly, the, the themes that started to bubble up were issues around literacy uh, with some of the kids that were in uh, college uh, prep. And the teachers, in many cases, did not have a whole lot of experience with how to reconcile some of those literacy gaps across the disciplines. Um, many of our special educators at the high school level are familiar with that, but some of our other teachers less familiar. And so quickly, we identified a partner uh, called Keys to Literacy. And in the three the courses, the three disciplines that actually have been consolidated, uh, we worked with that entire team just to give them some exposure to different strategies, literacy strategies, uh, from note taking to summarizing, just to being more deliberate and intentional in teaching students how to think, how to learn, um, and bolster some of the, kids, the skills that they had, but maybe just needed some more explicit instruction. Uh, so the next steps that we're now looking at is identifying uh, some of the teachers that are very interested in facilitating further discussion. Uh, we've talked a little bit with the assistant superintendent about identifying a pilot group of ninth graders, perhaps a ninth grade uh, team, to work on some of these strategies and kind of see what works and what doesn't so we can bring it more to scale as we continue the implementation. Uh, but then the second kind of prong of this level consolidation has been more the social emotional side, understanding different behaviors that, that pop up and really trying to give teachers the tools around cooperative discipline. Uh, trying to anticipate using PBIS as a way to model, but then having tools to kind of de-escalate, redirect, uh, that they just really hadn't run into in the past. And so uh, most recently, a partner that we've teamed up with who has kind of those both angles, works on differentiated instruction, differentiated assessment, but also cooperative discipline is engaging schools. Uh, so we've just begun that work in uh, December. They've come and kind of observed our classrooms to see for themselves what are some areas that we really do well, what are some areas in those classrooms that we can improve upon. Uh, and they've met several times with our uh, department heads uh, who are affected by level consol the uh, level consolidation. And we are now, actually this Wednesday, we'll be meeting with the entire group, the same group that did the keys to literacy work, uh, to kind of further that discussion really around the definition of, of engagement. What does it actually mean? How do we maintain rigor? Uh, how do we make sure we don't lower standards but also leave kids behind in that level of consolidation? Uh, so, so far, it's, it's off to a good start, and we're, you know, we're hopeful that continues the rest of the year. Okay, so now we're just going to talk about how we're building the capacity of the staff. So, um, something that was in my school was in Planet Parker and um, was born from the idea of we were working on differentiating instruction last year, especially the math teachers, that was their primary focus last year. So, this year, um, although still a primary focus, I wanted to spread it beyond the math teachers because there, I was finding myself um, having, you know, asking teachers to go see other teachers, but there were other disciplines, but still applicable to any content area as far as the strategies that they were using. So I found, I, I figured it would be best to have teachers, all the teachers participate in what I call instructional rounds. So I put the teachers in groups of five or six, and they each have a day where they are observing each other and giving each other feedback. And the whole idea was they had focused areas. Their focused area was um, was um, differentiating instruction and um, meeting the needs of diverse learners and high expectations. So when they were um, when they go around and they observe each other, they give each other feedback um, on what was an efficient and effective practice that was used. Maybe I already use it, but I could I adjust the way that I use it in my own classroom. What was um, a differentiation strategy that was that I never used and I could implement and how could I implement that in my classroom and they could also um, um, uh, teachers could actually ask for critical feedback from each other this first go around of it I wanted to make sure that that it was a safe space it's not evaluative um, that teachers would were only asking for critical feedback if they if they were comfortable with that purpose was to get all the positive and effective and um, effective differentiated instruction practices um, from each teacher that they possibly could. So 
Um, we have our last round of it tomorrow. So then after that, I will be following up with a survey to see, um, to get their feedback on it. I'm really interested in it. Um, you know, it has, it has fostered, you know, collegiality in the building. They, the, this round, I mix teachers up across grade levels, across content areas, um, so that they were seeing very different things in the building. So I think it was twofold that they were getting um, practices that they might not necessarily have seen before or done in a different way, but also that they are um, forming relationships with people in the building and go to people that they haven't necessarily had before. So for example, I had two teachers the day after their instructional rounds come through two different doors in the office and they walked in and they said, hi, new friend. You know? and they, so, um, so things like that. And, and I know that might not sound like much, but the relationships are what keep us coming to work every day, right? So, um, um, you heard from Courtney earlier about the five steps of inquiry and it was really amazing at the district level and I know she kind of explained the model already, but it was something I wanted to share too because it was really powerful um, how she, took our district leadership team and administrators and teacher representatives through um, the data protocol, the five steps of inquiry, and using cash data, we really came up with some really enlightening conclusions that we probably didn't prejudge that we would have known that we would have seen prior to that process. And we loved it, and we had different voices at the table that wouldn't have been there before, and it was very exciting. So Ricky and I decided that we wanted to take that into our buildings and so we did the same exact five steps of inquiry with our ELA, our math, and our science teachers using their MCAS data from last year um, and used a nice two-hour block of time that we had this December, I think it was. And they went through the same process and they were also enlightened. And it, what it does is it actually allows you to draw conclusions from data that you're actually looking at and then own those conclusions to then help inform the work. And so that was really exciting for us to feel empowered by Courtney and to kind of then empower our teachers to do the same. And from that work, they then changed things they were doing in their classrooms, um, classroom practices, and questions they were asking of students. For example, the math teachers concluded that they needed to ask more questions related to real world problem solving and more rigorous problems that had multi-steps that you know they identified those as areas of weakness and now they're building those types of questions into their everyday problem solving in math so we hope it obviously has <coughs> outcomes that are positive for our student learning um, and we have many other examples but that was one piece we were very excited about and then we have one last um so just uh, <coughs> quick as I can get on the data teams. But so the data teams happen in different forms and it depends on what it is that you're looking for. So we have, we have, we look at data, um, um, team-based data, we have grade level data, we have building-based data, um, then of course we look at the district data um, that's been driven by Courtney. But Depending on what we're looking at, the teams look different. So we do look at and examine data and go through protocols with our um, leadership teams. So that data is more building-based data with our um, team leaders. That would be things like most recently attendance and um, time out of class and things like that. Then we have um, data teams, data teams that look at, um, like in my building, quarterly data and we make adjustments to practice and provide students with, you know, we come up with intervention plans for students based on that data. That is more academic data, social emotional data. Um, that's also attendance, time out of class, things like that. All those types of data that Courtney was previously referring to, but it looks different and um, depending on, the teams look different depending on what kind of data you're looking at, whether it's building based, team based, or grade level based. And none of that great work would be possible without Courtney. Who is just phenomenal with what she provides to us in terms of the data. So, <laughs> so here's some of our teachers doing that analyzing of the MCAS data. It's really neat. So, um, one example, just facing history training, we had a day and a half at the middle level of this facing history training, which was excellent. They actually <coughs> brought the teachers through some of the exercises that the teachers would then be doing with the students to help them feel the impact and actually experience it rather than just teach it, which was great. 
Um, and one other we had, besides our Facing History PD, we had the Anti-Defamation League come to both middle schools and they did an anti-bias training about explicit versus implicit bias. Mm -hmm. And that was also eye-opening, I think, to many of the teachers. And I think there's more work to be done. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And then just a specific uh, example of capacity building at a high school, uh, kind of piggybacking on Ms. Shanklin's point about relationship building, really wanting to emphasize how important the role of the teacher is, how they know the students, seeing things change, subtle changes in behavior in some cases every day, uh, but really understanding the different forms of trauma. Of course, it was that Leslie University has offered, a number of our teachers have taken, um, and who are not counselors, who are not guidance counselors, social workers, we do have those folks as well doing it. Uh, but really trying to understand as practitioner how can different types of trauma, be it divorce, be it uh, death in the family, be it bullying in the past, uh, moving, all kinds of different trauma, how that may manifest in the classroom and how they can use their personalized relationships to help kids make, uh, feel more safe so that they can be more productive learners. So that's been a real nice uh, addition to our, our uh, school as well. I think that's going to lead to me. Oh, so now we're going to move it to okay. Carol. Okay. going to talk a little bit about I'm just going to talk briefly um, as we had talked about um, Thank you. back in the fall. Thank you. Because this is related to secondary as well. Um, we were beginning the um, program review of our language based program. And we identified, um, due to some budgetary constraints and also based on the work that we've been doing, that it would make the most sense to begin the review at Parker Middle School. As I had talked about previously, we did invest a lot of training and time at Parker with the Landmark School. We had our consultant uh, doing some coaching there. And we really wanted to see, through a program review, if the model we used of training and support for our teachers is actually creating the program that we want. So it took a little while to identify a person who would do the program review. Many of the resources we contacted, I think I shared with you in the fall, we had a lot of dead ends. So ultimately, we have contracted with, we're working with Melissa Orkin. Um, Melissa is the program director for the Center for Reading and Language Research at Tufts University. Um, we're really excited to have her come in and take a look um, at what we're doing at Parker. She started coming in in February um, to do classroom observations. John, you can probably move up the slide. Oh, Thank you. You have the clicker. So. Um, so she's come in to look at each cohort in sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade of uh, the students in our bridge program. And she's followed them over a course of two days to see how lessons build because she felt it was really important to not just observe one day because one day is really just a snapshot. You want to see what's happening and then how does the teacher build on that instruction. So she's been at Parker doing that. She's also had an opportunity to sit down with some of our staff, both our general education and our special education staff, um, to get some feedback from them. She had some surveys. Um, she provided, she gave surveys to the administrators, including myself, um, the team chair. Um, Ricky also has a survey. Um, we also had an opportunity to meet with her and kind of talk face to face. Um, the next step we're going through is a survey for the parents um, at Parker. Um, those parents, it will just be for those parents who are enrolled um, in the bridge program at Parker. The survey will be coming from Melissa. Um, it isn't something that I would have access to. I know the CPAC had some concerns about sort of how that is going to be distributed and it will be from Melissa. Melissa will be analyzing the data. Once we get all of this feedback, Melissa will be giving us a written report and part of that, the plan is really to um, share that out with the CPAC as we talked about uh, back in the fall and utilize a facilitator to help us kind of go through that data process that we've been talking about with families and other stakeholders to really see what our data shows about the program there. Um, we are excited about this work and um, are looking forward to that uh, feedback. So. Thank you. So I don't know if you want to take questions at this sure, point. I think for that section. For that section? I don't know. I'm not sure. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I guess I just wanted to highlight I, I, um, there's a, an awful lot about sort of building the relationships and, and one thing is I, I don't know what we can answer tonight. I just, I can't figure out like how do you actually mine the time out? How are you doing this? Because it takes a lot of time to pull the teachers together to do the analysis. Um, 
and to do the training and so we need to actually to keep that as a strong priority in terms of what the data shows us, I, I don't have the um, YRBS data in front of me, but I know that, that that whole piece about students having a trusted adult, someone that they can they can they have a relationship with that they can they can go to, we've made tremendous progress in that that um, percentage over the years, like over the last I don't know, it's probably ten years now, but yep. um, and I what I see tonight is, you know, there's there's so many facets to that um, and I, I would imagine though that there's some people that might without any context look at this and say Did, you know where's where's like the, the math and the social studies and the science and it's threaded throughout here but it's threaded throughout here in the context of the, that social emotional um, support um, so it, it's a simplification to say you know children need to be healthy to learn and learn to and, um, and learn to be healthy but because it's so much more complex than that and I um, just appreciate you know just uh, and the other thing that I heard is you know we try we, we move in some direction we try something and with um, the work that the support that Courtney has been able to help pr provide um, you now have the data to say that isn't quite working and we need to just you know hang a left and then another right um, so I, I think that's something that you know I haven't really heard as much before and I think that it's really important because you know we, we, we talk a lot about data informing our action but if we don't have access to the right data and we can't interpret the data um, or if we're consuming so much of our teacher resource trying to figure out how to analyze the data so I just think there was um, you know a lot of again I, I, I would imagine that there are people who um, maybe were went to school and reading a long longer time ago than me um, and might look at that and say you know why is that so important but when I think back on my own experiences um, there were opportunities even when I was here at Reading High to establish relationships with teachers and those were the things that made the biggest impact on me and my academic performance as well as you know me as a person so I think that these are all um, critical and I appreciate that the data shows that the establishing those relationships is really important because of um, the, the from the YRBS survey the the issues that students face um, in middle school and high school that are stresses that can cause them to make poor choices um, that could really harm them so I appreciate it a couple of things jumped out at me um, one that I really appreciated was that data is not just numbers or scores it's something that is formed by questions the teachers are asking and want to know and that there are different ways to go about finding those answers and the um, process of observing different classrooms um, in a group in a way to extract the information um, about what are good practices and how is differentiated learning being done and how might that translate to my students whether or not it's in the same discipline um, that really struck me one of the questions I had is how do you manage that how do you manage the timing to have five teachers go and observe in different classrooms I just I'd be really interested so I did it um, so I didn't need um, I managed it within the building. You got it. Can you just come to home, Mike? Sorry, otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. So I managed it within the building. Um, for some of it, but some of it I did have to get subs for the teachers. Um, but for the, I organized the teachers in a way that I knew I wouldn't have to get subs for everybody in order to make it happen. So it wasn't. I didn't have to have five or six subs every time I did it. So we had. Um, 11 of them this year so that everybody would have an opportunity to do it so yeah go ahead yes so in terms of building in the time for the teachers to then talk about what they observed is that during the Wednesdays or no so they did it all within that day it was an action-packed day so they didn't they didn't 
they didn't actually teach a lesson for the whole period. So, so they had to figure out their schedule. This was something I, I did in a faculty meeting early on in the year, talked to them about why we were doing it, um, contextualized it. <laughs> so they um, knew what the purpose of it was. And then I talked to them about what the expectation was, um, how they were going to schedule it. They actually took time during the faculty meeting to, to look at their schedules and, and schedule their day so that they'd be, pre be prepared for it. Um, the snow days didn't help because that took a couple of, <laughs> derailed us a couple of times, but, uh -huh. um, but spread it out across the year and our, like I said, our last one's tomorrow. But they, um, they did a really nice job embracing it and they, they teach, um, they were teaching for 30 minutes, so they teach a 30 minute lesson um, and then they would have someone else cover their class for the rest of that lesson. They would go and they would debrief the rest of that 20 minutes of that period. So they didn't take a whole period for the lesson. So they did a mini lesson, a 30 minute lesson, and then debriefed about it. Um, had, had time to actually think and take notes about it before they actually talked about it. Um, so they were collaborating the entire day. And it was a lot of, they said it was stressful. Um, so they were rather stressed about it in the beginning because they were worried about their peers observing them and they value what their peers have to say. And um, But at the end of the day, most of the things, the conversations that I was hearing as they were leaving was, oh my gosh, that was so great, I learned so much. So we'll see what the surveys say when they were done. But, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's overwhelming and awesome all at the same time. Yeah. So. Follow up just one. Yep. The other thing that I was really impressed by was the willingness to evalu evaluate yourselves. So to put the surveys out for really open-ended, maybe unexpected answers mm -hmm. so that you can really learn from what people's true experiences mm -hmm. were, both from the logistical and the feelings of them. I know from having done evaluation work in my last life and, and doing it again through projects here, you have to really, not necessarily, I mean you expect the unexpected, but you have to grapple with that when you get it. And so I'm really glad that you're doing that because yeah. that's a really great way to grow. So for the advisory, I, I have to say I was emotional about it because <laughs> we put so much time into it and so when I read some of the some you know some of the comments I was uh, you know concerned at first but then when you actually take a look at it all together and then say okay where are we going to go with this and then take the opportunity to take an hour staff meeting with Courtney's help and make it um, efficient and get the job done and analyze the data all within an hour and then when they come out with what what um, I guess was expected but unexpected. They they came out with so much material for us to work with after that. It it's amazing. So and everybody's voices are heard and we can address you know, address the issues. So Oh my god, thank yeah. you. And one additional step that will be happening in my building this week too, and I think in yours as well, is sharing the data back with the students and saying this is how you told us you were feeling and you know, actually just empowering them with their own data and asking them what they want to do with that, you know, or what their needs are. I mean, we have our own ideas kind of, of what, how we might address that right now and their needs, but, you know, really, again, have them own the, the solution in the next step so that they feel heard and that they feel connected to what's going to happen next. So mm -hmm. that's exciting too, but we get a little bit of the unknown. So. <laughs> but we're doing it together. So. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, you actually uh, anticipated one of my questions, which was how the students' voices and the students' impact comes in. If you guys could just give me one second, I have a couple <laughs> of questions. Um, one, it gets at the communication. So when you're doing the interventions um, with students, whether they are the kind of hard, um, what did you just hard say, scheduled. hard, hard scheduled, or the kind of spot <laughs> on the moment, what kind of is there? typically communication with families around that to let families know what's happening and Mr. Barker maybe you can speak to that at the high school too if there are concerns about a student's state of mind for instance um, maybe there isn't one 
answer fits all there. So what kind of communication is with families? And also getting into the two-way communication, what opportunities are there for, for families to reach out to all of you and say, I have a concern about my child's math or social emotional state or what have you. So families at Parker have the option to not accept it. You know, so mm -hmm. when they're hard scheduled, so we're, they're told this is what they're going to be scheduled mm -hmm. for, and they have the choice to take it or not take it. Um, as far as the um, more short term, yep. that is that's something that came up when we first did this, and the teachers are like, well, "Okay, now who's gonna, who's going to um, communicate this? Are we communicating it? Are you commu communicating it?" And the decision was that the the teacher that was providing, um, or the teacher that was the subject teacher um, that was going to be the skills that were addressed was going to be contacting the parents. So the parents could say, no, I don't want it, um, but that hasn't happened yeah. in the short term. Yeah. Very similar at Coolidge, and it started out with the students being a little more reluctant to participate in those softer scheduled things mm -hmm. I found at Coolidge, and parents a little bit reluctant, like, what do you mean my student needs this, or, you know, how did you identify them? And now it, it, it's almost flipped, yeah. where the kids see that as really helpful to get extra time on the math, pro you know, the math topic at hand, or um, the more individualized attention on learning how to organize or to study and they're seeking it out and we st almost have to limit the spot so that's another one of our challenges moving forward is how to provide more opportunity for more kids. So okay and would the student initiate it or can the parents initiate it or is that parents, still in process of development? Yeah I mean the, as yeah. when we are always looking at student needs we mm -hmm. look at each student individually and we think about what does this student need and what interventions can we put in place and we're using this intervention space as one of those things mm -hmm. and that can be initiated by the teachers but that right. same conversation can be initiated yeah. by the parents mm -hmm. and then they become part of the conversation about what we think that specific student needs based on what they're experiencing. So, okay. so it sounds like there is family. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We've been very clear, though, it is not a time to make up missed homework. It's sure. It's, homework. Yeah. it's intervention. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank right. you. And similar with the high school, it's mm. been pretty straightforward of just sort of communicating uh, to families when report cards, progress reports come out. And with the plus portals, it's helped to make it a much more proactive um, and responsive process. Uh, what we're still trying to work out now is, is when the numbers in one specific area, let's say it's executive functioning or an area in numeracy that we're seeing, uh, having that be really a, an entire group unto itself, a writing lab, uh, we're still in the process of figuring out where are our recurring <coughs> needs so we can be a little bit more intentional about let's create a center versus you know with their teacher. So that's been the, the most recent debate is they like working with their teacher in that area on the flex block, but sometimes bandwidth wise it's just the line is out the door so trying to better separate what we need for each kid. Thanks. And you also communicate with the families? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So our assistant principals, our guidance counselors, uh, they will meet with the student and they'll talk with the uh, home uh, and send a letter following up just sort of explaining what, you know, what we're hoping to do. Great. Thanks. And um, so Mr. Barker and Superintendent Dari, are the, I really liked what I was hearing about the work with the keys to literacy and engaging schools. Um, is that plant work continuing all year and do we foresee that going into the future as we kind of, it's a multi-year process I'm sure. It's all based on budget. On budget. So yes. and if ideally it will go forward it sounds like. It's been useful work it sounds like. Okay, thank you. And then um, Mrs. Wilson, just one quick question. So I heard what you said about working. Thank yeah, thanks so much with the uh, having the bridge program at the middle school evaluated to help assess the effectiveness of the landmark training um, if there were more capacity would you also be looking at doing that work at Joshua Eaton as well so or? I think really we need to look at it as a multi-year process right. so this year really the focus was on Parker mm -hmm. um, and we really you know we have to look within our budget so we're using right. some grant funding to do that um, to be able to do this um, but you know, there wasn't enough grant funding to cover the entire cost um, to do the whole district. So Parker seemed like a logical choice given the work we have been doing. Um, in my mind, the next step would really be looking at um, the high school the because high school. they were doing the same work as Parker. Um, Joshua Eaton this year, um, as you know, we had some turnover in staff. We've been doing a lot more training and Landmark is coming in the second half of this year to do coaching with them. And I see that coaching and support continuing into 
into next school year, I don't think they'll be in that same position. So unless, you know, there may be recommendations we receive from this report from Parker that might change the direction we go at Joshua Eaton. Right. So, you know, there may be findings that are applicable at all levels that we can generalize as well. So, um, you know, it will, you know, my thought was we look at what we're doing at the high school level and then circle back at Joshua Eaton. But it may be that based on this recommendation, it may lead us to say, oh, let's go back to the elementary level and see what they're doing. Okay, so in other words, the middle level will kind of help us see where our vertical yes. alignment is. Where do we want to go? go from okay. Yes, Thank yes. You. So the middle level really was where we had started and prioritized this work, given some of the needs and structures. And we really did um, a lot of training, a lot of coaching, a lot of looking at the systems at Parker. Um, so we're really hopeful we're going to get some helpful feedback that's going to guide where we go next steps. Thank you so much, everybody. This is just have a quick follow-up. So the mm -hmm. advisory and a lot of the discussion, because it was just a, a, a comment about budget. So these are pieces that are in real jeopardy with the FY19 budget, or in terms of the, the advisory periods are impacted. I'm just sort of wanted to get a sense of that. The, I know we, we talked about it. You mean if we needed to go down to a six period day? Yeah, what, and, that, and I thought yeah. I... It understood. might be a little different at each school, but I know at Coolidge our ratio of... The advisory would remain, but the ratio of teacher to student would change. So okay. that, that would have an impact in the relationship building, but we would keep the curriculum and the time so, set okay, aside. So the, and the number of advisory periods per cycle are, would remain, but For me, I could keep that as I, I currently have it and I right, we haven't so we haven't made a decision about how ours is going to look we know that we aren't necessarily thrilled with the way we had it this year as far as the timing of it because we had it either once or twice a week and we had a special advisory schedule on the days that we had it um, so we had the same total amount of time but not this not the same scheduling of it so we are looking at doing it differently next year um, but the same amount of time towards it would be the same but we feel it's important enough that we're going to keep it mm -hmm. you know we'll have but it. the ratio of t uh, number of students is going to be higher also right. at Parker right. yeah, yeah, because okay. our yeah. the number of teachers right. will be lower if right because all the teachers uh, yeah, yeah, have yeah, yeah less teachers, all the teachers so have advisory right. okay thank you thank you <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> I don't know if his question is for these. Well, if you have a question, please. Uh, just a quick, I just didn't know what the status of the face, sorry, what the status of the facing history um, course was for program curriculum was for ongoing. Do we have it again next year? It's it's, yeah, once you yeah. once we paid the <coughs> initial fee through the grant, we got a certain amount of PD and then the creation of the sessions, they will work with us for another mm -hmm. couple hours and then we have access. It's almost like the door has opened to, to a lot of their curriculum that otherwise we wouldn't have had access to. So that piece will be in place. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So I, I heard a lot about looking at our cycle of improvement systems and practices. I heard the promise of data and that there's a lot of data swimming around and being used in our district, but we didn't see a whole lot of data. Maybe it's too granular. Um, but I, the gap that I'm trying to fill in my mind is, so I trust the data is there. I just, I just, we didn't see a lot of it. Um, the outcomes piece, I'd like to ask a couple questions about, which is the last part of the cycle. So I'm looking at our, our goal. So we're in the second year. We're about halfway home, right, uh, Dr. Darty? We're, we're in the middle of a three-year set goal, or district improvement That's plan, right. I should say, not goal. So our district improvement plan, we're supposed to do three things for students, right? We're supposed to increase engagement, improve academic achievement, and decrease discipline referrals. So I heard a lot tonight about student engagement, which is, which is really good. And I think I heard some outcomes in, in the presentation tonight, such as having sharing data with students and having them give you feedback. So that's, that's good. Have you seen improvements in outcomes for academic achievement and for discipline, decrease in discipline referrals compared to last year? <coughs> I mean, I can say, well, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Our discipline data is way down this year at Coolidge, and we, have, we actually haven't had a conversation too much across the two buildings. Um, but, and especially in regards to bullying or harassment, it's been 
completely low this year. Yeah, way down mm -hmm. relative to the last year or two. And I'd be happy to actually bring back that data for you if you're interested. Um, and academically, in terms of um, the work we were doing with the teachers in ELA math and science, that was MCAS driven. So we look forward to seeing how that looks, you know, after this year. Um, as we've looked at our data, we have been pleased with trends in our data over the last couple years. And, but again, we've been using PARC for two years and then MCAS, so it's a little bit tricky to compare. Um, but even in the data that we looked at this year relative to the PARC data prior, we felt like we were seeing good, you know, strong growth in English and math, definitely. Mm -hmm. I know we had areas to grow in science, and I can speak to Coolidge in that regard as well. But also we're switching to new science standards, and this year's assessment is a hybrid of the old and the new, and then by next year it will be all new. So that's also a little bit tricky to, to gauge how that's going to go. But because we're not going to be able to compare that to the old anymore as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. but, I mean, which we had already talked about earlier this year, our, our, special, ed, our special needs um, subgroup performed very well last year. With their, with their student growth was up there with, with their typical peers. So, mm -hmm. And last year where I had um, special education referrals by teachers was probably at about 12 to 15. This year I'm at about 6. So that number's of about half, which is good, because that speaks to, our, I think, what we're doing in intervention space and um, building teacher capacity with accommodating student needs without needing to go right to special education. So I'm excited about that, too. Yeah, and over the past few years, uh, actually, we just saw some data from our work with engaging schools. Uh, the attendance rate has gone up, particularly for subgroups. Uh, where attendance was an issue. We still have our challenges with specific uh, kids, but it, overall, the areas that we're really concerned with in terms of attendance has, has certainly improved. Discipline has gone down. Um, our achievement rate, especially for students in, uh, in certain subgroups, special education, has gone up. Uh, and probably, I think one of the best statistics is that the dropout rate has gone down and graduation rate has gone up. And I, I attribute a lot of that, I think, just what mentioned, just that kids feel more connected uh, and really making that a priority. And sometimes that causes waves, but really making that an emphasis that we all have to take, uh, you know, take seriously. And, and kids that sometimes don't make it easy, uh, that don't really want us to, on the outside, take uh, pay close attention to, but really trying to emphasize that uh, seems to be paying off. So I mean, I'm encouraged by that, I and mean, I think, and I just wanted to let everybody talk. I wasn't reacting. I just want to get everybody a chance. Um, the eye on the prize for me here is is, and we don't need this as for my account for as a follow up for the meeting. But as we at some point we're going to check in with this improvement plan again, and when we do, it'd be helpful to see a slide where for each of these three student outcome areas, if we saw some some metrics of whatever you're already measuring, and, and people may before, I'm not asking for more work to be done, but you, you collect a lot of great data. Uh, I would find it really helpful to just see how the approaches you're taking is leading to outcomes because you did a really good job describing the systems and practices and how you deliver the MTSS to students. It's very thorough, but just one more slide sure. in the next sure. update with what, what your metrics are. Um, I have a different question. Ms. Rook, I just, it, it's 9.30 and we still have five, four schools that have to present. That's all. Six, yeah. Six, Six schools that have to present. Right, no, well, five. Uh, uh, oh, oh. No, no, she's not presenting. <laughs> Really quick. Do, do really quick for Mr. Bacher for oh. the high school. Just sorry, I had you before. Uh, and I'll keep it quick because I know we have to move on. The one thing that you said that I, I maybe this, this isn't the time, but um, I did want to revisit as a committee with maybe a separate update another time. You, you talked about the level consolidation mm -hmm. and just we were operating, I think, under a, a shared understanding that that um, collapsing CP and SCP in a number of subjects all at once was the best way to address the achievement gap. Mm -hmm. And if that if that understanding is, is proving to not be um, a, as, as universally positive for students as we had hoped it would be, that's something I'd like a full update for the committee on another mm -hmm. time. So I don't, I don't need it now, but another time, another sure. agenda item. Just, just so you're aware, we're yeah. phasing it in. We, we didn't do it all at once. Well, I, I just heard Mr. Bacher's comments that I thought just 
they raise some questions, but I, in the interest of time, I want to move on. I mean, you can, you can speak to yeah, it if you I mean, like. Yeah, it, it's gone very well. Uh, it's addressed a lot of the issues early on. Like, as I said earlier, I think, you know, in a perfect world, we would have liked to delay it a little bit more uh, and have the PD up front. Uh, but early on, the, the statistics, the numbers have been fairly consistent. The biggest challenge we have are a few pockets uh, because we're not, as Dr. Doherty just said, we're not consolidated. We haven't consolidated across all disciplines. So students who you know are continuing to be in the CP uh, math level, for instance, uh, unfortunately the scheduling effect, and if a student is an IEP, has an IEP, has caused a few pockets of students that are highly concentrated still, mm -hmm. uh, which you know which we're working through in this year's scheduling process. But as the levels con continue to get consolidated, uh, that issue becomes less and less. So. Good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Pre K. So thanks for hanging in there. Okay. So I'm, I'm starting off. Hi, everybody. Um, so I think what's great about this night, about talking about the district improvement plan, is all the great achievement towards goals. Um, and that you hear the unique character and culture of the different buildings. But something that we all have in common, in common is our drive to support all the students of the Reading Public Schools. So that kind of brings us all together. Um, and so just to keep in line with the theme of talking about systems, data, and practices and the outcomes that they drive, at the elementary level, we have many things in common among the five elementary schools. For example, would be uh, the AMC math professional development. Um, by the end of this year, all um, pre-K to grade two um, staff members, as well as most of the special education department would have had that training. So that's very exciting to us and helps us fulfill goals as we move moving forward. Also, writer's workshop. Um, looking at the district improvement plan among the five schools, we um, overlap and some are individual and reaching uh, focus areas a, B, D, and E. Um, and uh, something else that we have in common in terms of our practices is taking literacy um, and making it cross-curricular. So you'll see um, a lot of work in the sciences and math and social studies. We're retired, tying in uh, reading and writing as well. Um, and that, um, along with all the great work that Courtney's been doing, you know, pre-K to 12, that our work is data-driven. We're taking information and it's guiding us in terms of our interventions and our classroom instruction. Um, and also letting us know what things are working and are not working within our individual buildings. Um, and we're, we have great conversations around um, those targeted pieces. Um, some examples for, uh, of systems, so basically, what are the adults doing to support student success? And see the typical bolded items that are doing collectively among um, the adults in all of our buildings. Uh, working with data, and there's many different kinds of data, and it's not just academic data, but also uh, data on discipline, as well as attendance. Um, and then looking at the practices, um, both on the academic side as well as the social emotional side and looking at the whole child um, and how we're doing this work in each of our buildings is using the tiered um, tiers of intervention so looking at that we have universal interventions that means it's school-wide it's considered tier one all students are exposed um, to those learning uh, strategies. Then we move to a more targeted approach where you can see that as more of a small group setting based on the data that we're collecting in the different um, areas. And then moving on to more intensive approach that can sometimes be individualized, but doesn't have to be, uh, working with those students with the greatest need. Um, and so we're going to be looking at each of the schools um, to figure out what's unique about each school. So I'll turn it over to Mrs. Leonard. You can talk about um, so, Heather Leonard, principal of Barrows Elementary. Um, thank you. It looks like a change there, but not there. So, I'm in my hole. Um, I'm really excited to have the chance to work with this team um, collectively as a whole across the district, but the work happening that within the pre-K-5 has been really energizing and exciting this year and really getting calibrated and moving towards that 
increased level of consistency has been really exciting work. So as we've talked about this, we're realizing there's lots of layers of overlap, but given that every school um, has its own unique structure, its own area of expertise, its own area of growth, and school improvement plan through different lenses, we each have a different piece that we're bringing to the table. So um, Mr. Boyden, you asked a great question about the specific data. I would love to come back. I could. I, I love data. I would talk all day data with you, right, Courtney? Courtney sometimes is going to be on her office. Um, but that would really be giving you almost so much detail about my school. But I, what I do want to do is share a little bit about what we're doing with it. Um, so if you think about um, the triangle of levels of support that Lisa so accurately shared, I want to focus a little bit about one piece of one activity that we're doing with our teachers. Please know this is in no way the full comprehensive component. Um, but I wanted to share one of the school improvement plan goals we've been working on at Barrows is looking at the, the uh, achievement gap, specifically looking at frequently and consistently using current and accurate student data to set goals for student learning. This is something we've been doing over the last two years specifically, but in an ongoing way. Um, and I wanted to briefly highlight our data meeting structure and use at Barrows. And I'm not a bit of a delay. Um, Dr. Green, did the volume work on this? Um. I don't know. Oh, pop up. So we have a few different um, meetings that we use with different purposes um, with data. Two that I want to talk about is um, what you might consider more typical data meetings. At Bears, we call them the full data meetings. These are data meetings that we're looking as a uh, grade level team around aggregate data. So Courtney mentioned that big picture data. So we're looking at data results across the grade level. We try to do this aligned with those timely assessments that have just come out. So when we have a most recent um, common assessment around writing, we will look at that data in an organized fashion and use some really specific guiding questions um, to look through and analyze that data. It might be our most recent Foundus and Pinnell benchmark assessment, our mo most recent mathematics assessment. So it's the data that is timely and current, it also may be data that our grade level has realized we need to look at in that tier one manner across the grade level. For example, we did have a cohort that the data was repeatedly showing. We need to look at some of that behavioral data. So we looked at some of the social emotional data we had, and then we also designed some assessments that we use to collect. Please note when I say data, I do not mean quantitative only. We use observational data, qualitative data, data measurements, um, especially with our younger learners. We know a number is not a child. Um, so when, when I'm using that term, I'm really using it globally. Um, but so you don't just have to listen to me. Um, I wanted to share a voice of one of my teachers. Or not. Or not. Huh. Yeah. Not working? Not working. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> Sorry. well, that's okay. Um, it was my literacy specialist who spoke a bit about how we're using the Foundus and Pinnell benchmark globally this year. Um, at recent data meetings, and I gave you just a sample of a recent agenda, we used the uh, recent benchmark to really look at what are the lagging skills with the guiding question, what is holding students back from moving on to the next level? Um, and we looked at that really literally. We pulled out the different components within the assessment, and we sort of organized them and looked really specifically what piece of that reading is holding those students back. Um, and then we work together to plan that specific instruction for the student groups. So we're looking across the grade level. For many, it was one of the pockets of comprehension. There's various types of comprehension within reading. And we really worked collaboratively to plan around what that would mean for next steps. We're doing this across the grade level because sometimes you might have a student who needs one pocket, um, and it might be that there's a student in another class who needs that. So what does that mean across our grade level? It also means we're sharing ideas resources, challenge, challenging each other's thinking, um, which is really exciting. So that's an example of one of the recent full data that was focused on our tier one, the whole grade level aggregate data. We meet every six to eight weeks. That timing is not random. I do have six grade levels, but it actually really correlates with research showing that about a six week rotation when you're doing that data analysis keeps it current, but also allows you to take some steps in shifting your instruction and practice, have enough time for it to have an impact and measure data and update again. 
coming up next is our uh, what, what we've termed as our mini data meetings. Um, so it's actually the same size of a group, um, but they're shorter. So they take place, once again, every six weeks or so, and um, we take about 25 minutes for these. Now this is really focused on that tier two and tier three of the triangle. So this is when we're actually talking about students, individual students, and student groups. What is the data showing us that they might need? And we're literally mapping out if there are students that we're seeing have specific areas, lagging skills that we're finding in their data. We literally plan who is it, what specific skill do they need, who's the best person to intervene, how frequently do they need it, and how are we going to know if they're making that progress. Mm -hmm. So we're actually planning out our intervention in a collaborative manner across the grade level. This type of intervention could be provided within the classroom by the teachers, by our reading specialists, by tutors we have in the classroom, by our school psychologists. It could be done in a wide range given what the need might be. We have a group that was working on specific anxiety skills. That was something that our uh, school psychologist was providing a targeted intervention for. Um, we have some that were looking at some extension opportunities. So we are actually looking at they were far exceeding a particular area. So we planned an intervention block around that. So it's again, depending on the grade level, what we're seeing with that frequent data review where those students are and once again we meet and during our time um, you'll see some of the examples of what we do is we actually look to see are there students that are making the expected progress given the level of intensity of the intervention we have planned and it's working and we're seeing the progress we would expect they're good to go are there students that receive the intervention and given the progress we see they no longer need it which is our end game and we make sure that we that is giving us that end goal um, and are there students for which, given the level of intensity of the intervention, are not making the expected growth? And those are the students that would be then say, well, now what are we going to do? Because what we don't want is just keep giving you the same thing and, and assume that that's going to give you the growth you want. Um, what you would hear is one of my fifth grade teachers, and he would be sharing a bit with you about how we're using this time together across the grade level to really target specific groups and think about how we're using that data in a frequent time. Um, this structure is something that is frequent and ongoing, we use a wide range of data sources, and often what happens is, given the discussion, it lets us know what type of data we might need to look at next. This is certainly not the only time it's looked at, but it really gives us those benchmark times that we can make sure we capture. One other data source we will often use as well is, um, because our tutors are jam-packed with supporting students, they don't always get to sit in with us. Mm -hmm. So we've actually worked this year, my reading specialist has taken a great lead on this, and created um, creating data collection sheets so our tutors can actually know who they're working with on what skills and any observations of progress and notations about their progress as well so their voice is at the table along with um, any other specific groups that they've been working on to make sure that data is included so um, that's the data meetings at Barrows. Um, I'm going to pass it to I think uh, Julia Hendricks, Principal of Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. I'm Julia Hendricks from Birch Meadow, and I'm going to talk tonight about um, one of our school improvement plan goals and how we have gone about as a school addressing it. We were looking at, this is very much focused on the um, district area A, closing the achievement graph, and then also B, literacy instruction. And one of the things that we uh, are looking at is children who are two or more levels below the benchmark for that month in school. So every month um, there is a reading level that children should be at instructionally to order to make progress. Our first round of um, giving the Fontes Pinnell benchmark is in October. Every child gets benchmarked by the end of October. And what we wanted to do is see if we get 80% of the students who were two or more levels below the October benchmark to be one level below the June benchmark. So it's not only looking at improving literacy instruction, it's also looking at closing the gap for those children who are our most struggling readers so that they are not as far behind. They basically going to have to make more than a year of progress in a year to be able to do this for them. Okay. So um, I'm going to be talking a lot about the universal supports and a little bit about the tier two supports. And even though this is a list, you really can't think of it as an ordered list. They're all intersecting pieces that go together. One of the things that we did last spring is an assessment inventory with the entire staff. And some of the feedback that came out from a lot of staff was that 
people felt like they could do the benchmark assessments but didn't really have a good sense of the literacy continuum and understanding that the benchmark assessments are attached to. So you get this information, but then what are you doing? Where are you trying to move children? What are you trying to give them? So I formed a literacy team as a primary teacher, an upper elementary teacher, and a special educator. And with the school gift account and PTO support, they all went to the Leslie University Summer Literacy Institute, which was on the 2017 Fontes and Pinnell Literacy Continuum. And those teachers came back and have been providing professional development in the literacy continuum all year. They have to plan with me and provide professional development during our building meeting time. And I was also able to buy the new continuum book for all my teachers. So everybody in the building who is involved in literacy is attending this. So it's not only classroom teachers, it's special educators, the speech and language pathologists, because they do a lot of work with comprehension, and our school librarian are all involved in this professional development. And that is a t universal support because every child in the building benefits from that work. The other thing that we looked at was increased reading data collection, particularly in children who are struggling. We do the benchmarks three times a year, but we looked at um, implementing running records, which are another way to get a reading level on a child, but you can do it with a text they're actually reading in the moment in front of you. And I have a teacher who has a very strong practice of using running records very organically. So she did training with every grade level on using running records so that teachers could get data points more frequently on struggling children in a very easy way and use that to figure out what these children should be working on next. And so the, we increase reading, um, implement the running records, and then also the data team review cycle every roughly seven weeks, we would look at literacy data for the whole grade. That bumps up into the tier two because with this information, we could then form intervention groups. And the other thing that we did this year with the regular education tutors is rather than give people a schedule in September that was their schedule for the year, we used this information to assign the tutors to areas of need. So that the people, they might be working with a small group of children, they might be going in a classroom where there's a lot of need for a seven or eight week period, and then we could move people and reassign them as the data shows that. So we were able to target regular education tutoring staff to areas of need. So that is how we kind of created the structure. <coughs> so these are where our results are right now. Um, the last data we have is from January 30th. March 30th is the next data point. So people are actually doing running records and benchmark assessments on students right now. In October, we had 52 students in the school, grades one to five, who were two or more levels below the October benchmark. Of those 52 students in January, 11 of them are now at or above the benchmark for January. 14 are one level below the January benchmark. And we have 27 who are still two or more levels below. So roughly 50% of these students have moved within that range of being just one level below. We also, I looked at the students who were in October only one level below, even those are, students aren't in our school improvement plan, I wanted to kind of track them. In October we had 33 students who were one level below the October benchmark, and of those 33, 23 in January were at or beyond, and 10 were still one level below. So we will, like I said, we'll have a new round of data on these, all these children on March 30th, so we'll be able to see where we have moved with them and kind of make some plans for next steps. And now, oh, this is gonna, because we have a lag, I randomly went through the hall in between blizzards and other <laughs> cholesterol and all the other things. I just grabbed a few children and asked them, what have you learned in reading this year? And this <coughs> girl said, what I learned in reading is it can take you to wonderful adventures. So nice. My kindergarten friend here said he learned reading is good for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, we've got a little bit of a lag here. This first grader learned that when you get stuck on a word, you can go back and read the sentence all over again. 
And I had a third grade friend who wanted a picture of the book he's currently reading, not of himself, so that will come up in a minute. I hope. Oh, there we go. This year in reading, he's learned to read in his head more fluently. So that's some examples of what our children are learning and reading right now at Birch Meadows School. And I'm going to pass this on. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Julia. Um, I'm Sarah Lebeck. I'm the principal at Killam. And um, I want to take a moment for to thank the kindergarten teachers who were here earlier and fourth grade teachers who's here um, just so to show you that I think as a staff, um, not just at Killam but across the district, they were all really here for the kids and to speak for them. So I hope that this is showing you that every decision that we make is really about what is in the best interest of the kids. Um, at Killam, one of our um, mottos is that our kids can and our kids will. And so we really are embracing that and thinking about how all our decisions are based on not what we as adults want to be shifting, but what we know our kids are showing us that we need to shift. And so that's really the focus of all of our meetings. Um, so I could go on without it. That's okay. Um, <laughs> we have copies of the slides. Yeah. So, in, in speaking um, along the same lines of um, what Lisa had set forward for us and Heather, um, this is just a snapshot of what we're doing, but you can see the interrelatedness across the, the district of what the elementary are doing. So, I really wanted to focus on um, our systems and the data and how that's then informing our practices, so those two areas. And really what we think about when we think about tiers that growing degree in the general education. So one of our, um, again, district school improvement plan goals is looking at the achievement gap. And one of the things that we know we had to do at Killam was to really think about how um, we were making data informed decisions that were in the best interest, as I said, for our kids. But also that we were getting these designated intervention blocks put into place where we were making thoughtful and meaningful decisions um, for our students that really were about mathematics and literacy. So we put in um, to effect it a um, one hour a week intervention block per grade level. Um, and so I'm going to take you through that process of, of what the intervention block does, but also how we're making those informed decisions. And you'll see, as I said, that there's an overlap between the schools, but it does look a little bit different in every school. So again, when we think about just the system, so we have a Kilma block schedule, which um, essentially means that across each grade level, everyone has the same content areas at the same time. So all fourth grade is doing literacy at the same time. Um, and then at a separate hour, the whole fourth grade is doing math at the same time. And we did that because we really wanted to maximize our ability to think um, flexibly about small group work, but also to maximize how we're using um, the resources, limited resources that we have. So as part of this, it also allowed us to free up some time not only for um, common planning time across our um, each grade level. So for example, um, once a week all the third grades have a 30 minute block where everyone is in a special at the same time. So those teachers have an additional 30 minutes to get together and look at the data and think um, strategically about things. We also use that um, to be able to put into place this 60 minute intervention block. So again, that 60 minutes is across the entire grade level. So as I said earlier, all fourth grade has that same intervention block. So we thought about how do we uh, make these decisions about what's actually being reviewed in the intervention block. So again, going back to the data that's happening. So we also meet as grade level teams every six weeks to review the data. That's looking at formative assessments. That's also looking at our benchmark data. And from here, we're thinking about what interventions um, we've put in place. We're reviewing what that looks like, and then we're deciding if we want to move forward with that for <coughs> six weeks, do we need to change it in some way, or is there another area we're really missing and we want to make sure that we are um, dedicating our time to. And then, um, of course, we want those interventions, as I said earlier, to be tied to the needs of what the students are telling us in the moment that they need, and we want to make sure that we're um, being very thoughtful in our planning for these. So when teachers come to the intervention meetings, uh, prior to they have to submit their data to me. I'm compiling it for them again with the help of Courtney looking across at what are some of the trends that we're seeing and making sure we have clear pre and post data to go with that and I'll share that with you in a moment. And then we really think about why does it matter that we're doing this. So um, we know that we want to be um, adapting to what our students are telling us that they need but we also want to be um, really thoughtful about making sure that we're using our resources in um, a timely manner, but 
also in a productive manner. So for every intervention block that we have, we have um, cleared the schedule so there's at least one general education tutor attending that intervention block and oftentimes um, one if not two special education teachers that are off also doing that. So you have the luxury in that 60 minutes of again being flexible in how you're grouping students. Some um, grade levels choose to stay within their own classrooms and they might be using a more of a workshop approach where students are rotating through specific information or specific um, stations, whereas others may say, you know, this class is going to look on literacy, this one needs to target writing, and this one needs to target math, so we can be flexible on that way. Um, but what our tutor does is at least provide a fourth person or a fifth person um, for that grade level so that, again, we can have the small group targeted instruction. And then those tutors are also going in throughout the day with that block schedule to reinforce what's happening during those intervention blocks. Um, and we also want to make sure we have clear objectives as to why we're doing this. So it's not just um, this is 60 minutes of catch-up work. We really want it to be very targeted. So just to quickly show you um, what that might look like for us. Um, so um, unfortunately, I'm not going to have any sound for this either. Um, I did have a fourth grade teacher talking about this. But this is an example of a, of a fourth grade um, pre and post assessment. So one of the things that we've discovered and we know is an area that we need to work on is um, NCAS data indicates we certainly need to be very um, strategic in looking at close reading of the work we're doing but more than anything, finding evidence in the text to support both our written um, responses as well as finding the actual answers to something like a multiple choice question. <laughs> we also know um, that we need to spend the time um, allowing the students to think critically about um, how to analyze the text, um, even you know at a fourth grade level. So what we have here is just um, a quick snapshot of um, a few students. And on the left, you can see um, this was a passage that they took, something similar to what it would look like in an MCAS um, assessment. Um, and I should also say this was supported by the Crown of Canal uh, data that we're doing the comprehension work is showing us that this is an area we need to do. And so the students had four questions that they answered all about that analyzing the text. Each, each question correlated to one of four comprehension standards that we knew we needed to look at. And you can see on the left that um, we had students um, across all of the areas ranging. Um, you actually could get a zero, but we didn't have any students who did that. Everyone answered a question, which was great. So one being um, an area that, that student really needed to focus on. And the highest that a student could get was a five, which meant they were above grade level. So the left was that pre-assessment. So all teachers um, came into that data team with this pre-assessment already done. So we could start analyzing what were those groups going to look like? What exactly did they need to teach? And of course, the questions are going to help us with that. And who needed to be teaching that? And what we saw after that six-week cycle, again, when we did the post-assessment, same exact assessment that was given to the students before, is that we saw growth across um, almost all areas. So we're hoping that that will also be embedded then in the way that teachers are asking questions of the students during a general ed classroom um, discussion, but also the opportunities that the kids are having in small groups to talk to each other and to go back to the text and analyze it. So again, this is just um, one snippet of what it looks like for us to be analyzing data that goes beyond just looking at um, the benchmark data that we have or the MCAS data, but this is real world examples of how we're using it in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, again, what that it looks like from a system perspective and some of the data that's there. Thank you. I'm Joanne King. Love it in. Um, one of our areas of focus in our school improvement plan was really looking at improving literacy skills for all of our students and it's also part of our school improvement plan and we we're really looking at the supports that we have in place um, around our literacy instruction and then providing training and time for teachers to collaborate um, and to get some coaching and some supervision around their literacy instruction within the classroom and then also looking at our tier two interventions for our students who are struggling re readers, um, looking at the grade level expectations, we still, similarly to the other schools, using the Fountas and Pinnell benchmarks that we're doing three times a year and then identifying where our students are. So we looked at um, instructional practices was really our focus and in each of the, as you know, teachers have as part of their um, 
educational evaluation, they have student learning goals, they have professional practice goals. And every teacher in my building this year chose to include as part of their professional practice goal time to observe other colleagues mm -hmm. within the school or within the district. Um, and that was going to be part of their their goal setting as we moved forward. So it could be in any area, but as a school, we really kind of focused looking at the data on literacy. So what we wanted to do was provide teachers time to go in and observe other teachers. I have the um, fortunate experience that we have some amazing teachers in our schools, and I have a couple of teachers who have spent some time at Columbia at Teachers College really learning the units of study around Reader's Workshop. Um, I also have a new reading specialist who has been very successful in implementing the Level Literacy Program, which is a Tier 2, we're using as a Tier 2 intervention for some of our readers. So together, they've actually been collaborating and providing some coaching to teachers in the classroom setting. So we looked at this and we kept talking about it, saying, when are we going to give teachers time to go in and observe in classrooms? Because there's always that time factor. They're always with kids. When are they not going to be with kids? Um, so we met with um, school council and brought this up and talked about, you know, there's some, something teachers are really passionate about and they want to get into classrooms and to see what's going on, the great learning and teaching that are, that's happening. And the school council worked with us to come up with um, what we're calling March Madness. We're in the middle of it right now. We started last week, we have this week, and then we're going to continue it into next week where we actually have parent volunteers who um, have signed up based on it. So the teachers received a survey and they could sign up for um, an instructional practice that they wanted to see or a classroom that they wanted to see or a content area that they wanted to go in and observe. And then we set up a schedule and sent the schedule out to the parent community. And parents could volunteer to cover a one hour block in any grade level, K to five, and we would provide, they didn't have to actually teach, um, but they would provide, we would provide the activity um, that the students would be working on for that hour so the teacher could go and observe in another classroom. And um, I will say, I did. I taught at this school before I became principal, and it was very privatized. Nobody ever opened their door. You really didn't kind of share. You were the only one in the room working. So you really didn't know how you were doing. And I will tell you, 100% of my teachers have participated in this and are very excited about um, observing in the classrooms. So 100% of them have signed up to observe in somebody else's room or have somebody come in and observe them. So this is a sample of what went out to the parents. We need your help. Um, it's not just your child's classroom. It could be any classroom, but come in and work with our students for an hour to give our teachers chan a chance to go in and observe what's happening in other classrooms. Um, I've been in touch with the teachers. I actually covered a classroom today. So one of the teachers could go observe. A fifth grade teacher wanted to observe a third grade teacher who was teaching um, Reader's Workshop so she could see what it looks like a couple of grades younger. What are these kids coming up with? Um, and they had a great conversation. And these are two teachers that don't normally teach together. They don't have the same schedules. They don't have the same lunches. But now they're collaborating and talking about co-teaching a lesson with both sets of students, which is exciting. Um, my library media specialist went to observe the art teacher and my PE teacher because she wanted to get some ideas and strategies around classroom management to see if these same struggling students, what do they look like in art and what do they look like in music because I know what they look like in library and I've talked to the classroom teacher. So are there strategies that other teachers are using that now I can incorporate into my practice to help meet the needs of the students that we have in front of us. So we're just starting it. This is day three. Um, we have this week and then we have next week, but so far the teachers are very excited about it. The parents are excited to come in and see um, and work with students that they normally wouldn't be working with. It's not necessarily their child's class, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a classroom within our school. Um, and then listening to how excited the teachers are coming back from their observation and what they're learning and how excited they are about sharing their practice. So it's going to be fun. So Thank you. Kelly. Last, last but not certainly not least, Kelly Boxer, Rise Preschool Director. Um, I chose to focus on the very brief highlight oh, of closing the achievement gap. So I'm focusing on this section where all the students are um, participating. So I wanted to mention again that preschool is the foundation for the school district. <coughs> Um, what we're doing is we're working on our, our version of Writer's Workshop. 
Um, all of our uh, teaching staff um, has their professional goal and their student learning goal um, on uh, using writer's workshop, using um, the talking, drawing, and writing. They all did a book study um, last year for their professional part to learn how to do it, and now we're implementing it. And I also made it my uh, student uh, learning goal to make sure that they, they are implementing it with fidelity by the end of the school year. Um, we're also using handwriting without tears to develop our um, writing skills. And um, what they're pretty much doing is they're having lessons that have uh, storytelling. They draw the pictures to match their story, and then they do journal writing with adult support. So I want to show you, um, this is our version of data, is some uh, writing samples. <laughs> The next um, man here is Matt Man. Um, the students really love Matt Man. Um, they um, sometimes will um, get possessive of Matt Man, like who gets to uh, put him together, who gets to um, uh, put, put the items away, put them together. Even some of the uh, female students say they want to marry Matt Man someday. <laughs> so they really love Matt Man. So I'm going to show you a, a writing sample of a student who um, did a self-portrait before they had the Matt Man lesson. So this is a, a young gentleman named Robert. He this is his uh, before he had instruction in uh, Matt Man, and then this is after uh, in October. You can see that there's head, there's eyes, there's uh, legs, two legs there, two arms. And that, um, what we do is we start having them fill in. They tell us in all I like to and then shove them in the, in the leaf piles. Um, and they have to use at least two colors. And then um, if we look at now in February, um, after having multiple practices with Matt Man and our um, our storytelling, um, they have to put details in. You can see there's multiple details, and the, um, they have to use more than one color. And you can see this child has used more than one color, and you can see like we're actually guiding them through um, sentences. And then this is a uh, young lady, Samantha. This is before uh, the Matt Man lesson. You can kind of see a little bit abstract. <laughs> and then um, after a Matt Man lesson in October, in, in the fall, I like to eat apples. And then um, February, um, looking at, um, you know, what did you do over uh, February vacation? I played with my toys. So, and um, the different details, but you can definitely see the, the soft portrait has um, come along. So, thank you, and any questions for me? Thank you. Questions, not, not long statements, just because we want to be mindful, but if there's questions. Uh, yes. Great job coordinating across all five of you. That's very hard to do, all from separate buildings and being really busy. One question is uh, subpopulations and efforts to identify it sounds like you do this in various ways, but efforts to make sure that you're all looking at the same subpopulations and and making sure that students are getting a you know, comparable experience in each school. How do you how do you coordinate that between your different buildings? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the, actually, this is um, the first year that we are as a collective really thinking strategically about what data we're collecting across all of the grade levels. Um, I'm sorry, across all the buildings, and then when we're collecting it, so we have similar time frames, um, so that we're hopeful that by the end we can actually look at where we fall. Um, this year is probably going to be more of a baseline. Um, going into next year. But within that, that then allows us to break down um, even more strategically, again, with Courtney's help, um, who, who are our students and where they fall within those benchmarks levels. Um, for third through fifth grade, certainly the MCAS is um, a predictor of some of those pieces because it automatically gives you those subgroup populations and what that looks like. Um, but I would say um, our focus really has been on two areas the um, implementation of writer's workshop across um, all of the elementary schools and um, with Kelly with the read-write-draw. Um, and so looking at that um, for all of our students. 
and then um, K to 2, the AMC Anywhere, which is a math assessment mm -hmm. um, tool that we can use. And that um, naturally breaks it down um, by skill level, and um, we would have to identify within there the subgroups, but we can look at it at least at a skill level at this point. So um, I think with that map that we have and the fact that we're all collecting that information, um, we can drill down a little bit more strategically, um, but certainly I guess that this is probably the baseline here of what that's going to be. Yeah, um, I think the other piece too is that um, we d are also involved in the district data meetings that are occurring in addition to the work that we do as the, our elementary and pre-K-5 teams. So um, some of the aggregate data that Courtney has shown the trends across the different demographic groups is something that we can look at our school-wide data, but then she's also been able, uh, our district-wide data, that she'll also provide with us, and here's what your school looks like within that picture, so you can do a bit of that digging. Um, but then, you know, we've given snapshots, so I'm thinking about, you know, my building leadership team who looks at some other data sources I didn't speak about tonight, who will also look at some subgroups and what are we seeing, what do we notice. Um, I know my special education team, which also meets weekly, who also looks at their progress and things that are going. So there's there's multiple eyes on multiple data sets, and then pulling out those different demographic groups that you know, it's sort of the accordion a bit with um, looking at it vertically across district and across schools as well as horizontally across grade levels. Um, but I think the one piece that um, we don't have yet that I'm, that I'm optimistic we will in the future is we don't quite have a full warehouse other than the programs that already come with it like um, Sarah mentioned the AMC mathematics um, assessment and those that are naturally created like the MCAS. We don't have one house to put all of the data across buildings for every assessment in. Mm -hmm. So when you're really thinking about that collaboration, it's a it's a step, it's a place we're going to we need to get to, but we're not there quite yet for that. Jim, <coughs> sure. just a quick one. Jo Joanne, uh, just I, I love the uh, creative uh, use of parents in the, in the March Madness to save on re financial resources. <laughs> Can you talk about how you go about? Just in, I'm just, you know, in terms of the, you know, obviously Corey checks and mm -hmm. all that stuff, because it is, you know, I, I mean, I know I'm sure you're doing it. I'm just right. here because that's the first diet. So that's one of the things that we do at the very beginning of the year is we talk to parents about, we love having parent volunteers, but to be here, you have to have a Corey check. Um, we're fortunate that 99% of my parents do that because they want to either be on a field trip or um, participate in the classroom or volunteer in the library. So we've been able to do that. Each teacher also keeps track of which parents of the students in their classroom have completed Corey Checks um, active. So when we did the um, school council, Piece. when we sent out the survey she sends the information to me about the parents who are signing up and then we can just kind of cross check to make sure everybody's covered thank you yes just a question I'm not sure um, I think it was Sarah but uh, on the interventions mm -hmm. no, go ahead sorry okay. on the um, interventions um, I heard reference to um, sort of a interventions for students who are accelerated because when you look at where they are if your if your data is focused on you know are they at or above mm -hmm. the level that you expect that's that's one piece but you have to be looking at growth to know that you're also making sure those students grow mm -hmm. so I'm just sort of wondering if that is if there's a if all of our schools have an approach I'm most familiar with Kellum from my own personal experience um, so I just was wondering about that, Sarah who talked about it, but maybe I was wrong. Yeah, I think it would be, um, it would depend on what that intervention is. Like I said, uh, as an example, like Kiln, we might have within a grade level, we might focus on multiple subject areas so that we have opportunities uh, across multiple content areas. Um, at the same time, a kid who you know is really doing very well in writing might have that intervention um, in math, or might have um, more of a STEM project at that point. You know, even within um, that piece I showed you, the pre and post assessment with um, writing, for students who had like a five in certain areas, there certainly were other um, mm -hmm. questions that they still need to work on. But we also discovered, you know, if we're thinking about this, of how do we um, even expand? 
that we could expand the tax level of what the kids are being asked to do. So we need micro progressions of this would be one answer, this is how you're going to get stronger, this is how you're going to get even stronger, here's one more way you could get stronger, and also adding a typing component to it so that our students who can practice that. So, um, you know, it's a little bit multifaceted in that way, but in that same sense, we're going to offer a typing component that also for students who have IEPs, they may already be doing that, so they may be joining the group for the kids that are accelerated, um, and that, so that's a, you know, a group that's uh, multi multifaceted in that piece. But again, what each um, intervention group looks like at each school is a little bit different. So I certainly don't want to speak for anyone if anyone wants to give an example. So I can give you an example from Birch Meadow. Um, in my third grade, they were looking at multiplication concepts and it's a kind of a fundamental thing. Children really need to leave third grade with a good sense, good understanding of multiplication. So they kind of had um, bands and they went from during intervention block, children who were really struggling with basic concepts of multiplication up through children who had a really good understanding. And because we were able to put additional staff in, they had five different groups working during that hour, it was two 45 minute blocks a week at all different levels from very basic understanding to multi-step problems that had multiplicative um, embed multiplication embedded in them. And then I, in my fifth grade, they're using project-based learning for children who are above and so that they have um, projects that are within the same concept but that are multi-layered and involve bringing in um, many different resources so that they're working on that with teacher support while other children might be getting either more practice at grade level because they're not quite solid yet or um, intervention and remediation kind of work. Okay. Great. Those are two different ways that we've done it. Mm -hmm. Courtney, I'm sorry, did you have something? Yeah. I did, and now I'm trying to... Oh, oh, back to the subgroups. Yeah. Um, so actually we're doing that work, uh, this being the baseline here, as they were saying, um, we're kind of looking at this collectively on the same schedule of when they take certain benchmarks like the Fondus and Pinel. Uh, they can reschedule from the 21st to the 27th. 27. Yeah, so um, that's actually what we're collectively doing. The, the elementary team is doing a data discussion to walk through all the schools through um, where each group of students is and where they were in the fall um, at, above and at and below are split out and then below by one, two, or three or more. So fall and winter and then by subgroup, which I, subgroups I've done are um, the high needs populations, which is special education, ELL students, and economically disadvantaged students, and then also um, an additional subgroup I've included is METCO. So the, the, we'll be walking through that on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. I apologize for the Thanks for staying late. We should two minutes. So that, do the, so that they can. Yeah. What? Can we do two minutes so that they yeah. can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do consent and then. Yeah. agenda and then we'll do the report. Oh, isn't that the report? Okay. What's the mathematics update? It's part of our reports. Oh, okay. So we'll do the consent agenda. Okay. 
first. Is anything anyone wants taken off the consent agenda? Okay, move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All in favor. Okay, so we're going to go to reports now, unless someone from the committee of Jackson prefer just to have the administrative reports tonight. Is that everyone? Yeah, that's fine. Carol? I'm good. I'm Craig? Yeah, um, real quickly, two things. One is um, this Friday we have a staffing service day, and so it's our uh, institute day. And as part of that, um, as I've said several times before, one of our featured speakers is Dr. David Walsh, who is part of the, his coming here is also doing a community presentation on Thursday evening. So again, at, um, at 7 o'clock in the Performing Arts Center here at the high school. Um, and that information is on the district website. Um, I also, real quickly, just wanted to respond, and I, I apologize to Ms. Lieberman, I think that she had left, but she had, um, we did get the email into the packet, uh, but I know that she had brought up a couple of issues. Um, and she had sent it the email over the weekend, or I guess it was Friday evening, and I didn't get a chance to reply until later today. Um, but I did real quickly want to address two things um, that were that are here. One is first just about the curriculum documents um, that I, I told her in the email, and sort of in general, um, as a district, we've intentionally focused on our elementary, specifically our K-5 uh, curriculum, specifically reading, writing, and mathematics, knowing that um, from our data, that was the area that we really needed to focus on, also because we have five elementary <coughs> schools, and to make sure we, we found a way to ensure some consistency um, among those three vital content areas across multiple schools. Um, that's a lot of work, and it's taken a lot of time. I, I mean, I really want to thank all the staff who have contributed to that effort, because essentially we have created um, very strong drafts of 18 documents, basically K through five, in those three areas. Um, the reading and writing documents are published on our website. Um, we have not yet published the math, but as I said in the email reply, we did distribute those to all K-5 staff in the fall for them to ut utilize. Um, and we've since been receiving some feedback from staff. The state, as you know, made, made some updates in this last year, and so we're making a few minor tweaks here and there to align them. Um, overall, I mean, it's hard, you know, as time consuming as it is to create documents, that's actually the easier part of the process. Um, our goal, obviously, is to make sure that we afford staff the opportunity to get to know those. Um, to really unpack them, um, to really draw conclusions uh, about you know what is different in these, how they connect with the common assessments that we've put in place, how they connect with um, and prompt changes in our report card standards and so forth, and that takes time because we really just don't want them to be documents that get filed somewhere or get posted on the website, but that are used in a way that really can meaningfully inform their instruction and ultimately, of course, impact student outcomes in a very positive way. And that's a little bit longer process. Um, and But I think that that's underway and, and that that can continue. Um, but a couple things that uh, was pointed out about the access, the pathways and the access to the upper level courses, specifically AP Calculus. Um, and I guess I just wanted to say that absolutely we're on the same page across the board, that we want as many students as possible to access, if it's Algebra 1 and 8th grade, that they have the opportunity to do that, that they are able to access the courses that challenge them the most, that we, and I think most importantly, and I can certainly say this passionately as a former middle level educator, not to close any doors of opportunity to students when they're 11 or 12 or 13 years old at such a developmental stage. Um, so, and I guess the point that I want to make is, and certainly we want all of those 
students or any of those students that, that want to or need to or college or future career plans to access AP calculus or whatever AP courses or upper level courses that they want to. I guess my point would be that the indicator of, or the measure of success of that would not be the entry point to that pathway, but the end point mm -hmm. to that pathway. And that's what we're really looking at because I think it, it's a very understandable misperception um, with communities that the number of students who enter that path in eighth grade it will just continue and that was not the case and so I mean and I did send this and included in the email you could see going back in the last decade the number of students and most of the students by the way access those courses in 11th and or 12th grade mm -hmm. and so I've kind of combined those two grade levels to show the historical numbers of the enrollment in those particular classes and so the blue columns at the right, first I just did the raw numbers, and then realizing, of course, that there's some variance in the overall class sizes, I wanted to look at the percentages to get accurate, um, a, a more accurate perception. And you could certainly see, especially in year like 2013, 14, and 14, 15, we did experience a decline in the number of students at that. I mean, if you were a student that was sort of in that sixth, seventh grade year, right when things shifted, but absolutely, that was a challenge. Um, we wanted to make sure that we didn't make things worse for those students. That we that if they were they wanted to access those classes, that we were able to um, help them successfully. In the last three years, though, however, you could look at that and see that our numbers not only have corrected themselves, but has even begun to go higher um, than what we've ever had historically. In looking at this, I'm just actually thinking probably what I should have done and what I would encourage you to look at in the future is I would love to add, um, and let me show here a chart thing too, um, is to look at the number of students that took Algebra 1 in 8th grade. Because mm -hmm. I think what you would have seen at the beginning, back up to that, is that while those numbers in 8th grade might have been double, maybe even triple what they were now, and now you would have seen a very drastic fall off, falling off the cliff. I mean, when you see that, you know, some years only 4%, you know, 8% of students were accessing those courses at the end, it wasn't a model that was extremely successful. Um, and so our goal would be to absolutely make sure that when students enter that path, when they sort of jump into the pool, they're able to swim successfully to the other side. Um, and that's something that all of the districts that I've been talking to have been um, working on. Um, and they've even confided in with me, sometimes confidentially, that you know there's often a lot of pressure because of that point in eighth grade to get the, as many kids in there, but that does not mean that they're going to finish. And so I really commend our educators for saying, you know, we want to make sure that it's working, that it's successful. Um, I mean, this is the same data, just, you know, sort of a line graph. This is the raw number of students by year. The 17, 18 class is actually a little bit smaller. But then, so when you look at the percentage, you see we're above, and we've kind of been consistent for the last couple of years. The other thing I just wanted to say about the pathway, then, is that um, it, it, it would be an error to say that we no, do not have a pathway now that can lead directly to AP Calculus without doubling up. Um, certainly in those transition years, we had more students doing that. Now we have very few, and we would anticipate that we might have very few students of zero. Um, as you can see now, even if you are in the Math 8, um, formerly what would be known as the Math 8 Enhanced sort of course, mm -hmm. you, can split, you, you can still go into the Honors Algebra 1 course, which you would not take until ninth grade, and still have a straight pathway to 12th grade that could culminate in AP Calculus, um, if that was what you desired. And again, most of that now is due to the hard work of our teachers um, in successfully transitioning a lot of those standards. For instance, Algebra 1 is a very different course, as, as I've said many times before. Mm -hmm. So many of the Algebra 1 standards are now distributed in 7th and 8th grade. Um, Many of the standards now that are in the current Algebra 1 course used to be in Algebra 2 and some other classes. So it's those standards are completely redistributed. I do believe that's why some districts have even abandoned 
those high school names, yeah. algebra and geometry and so forth, and they mm -hmm. call it mathematics one, mathematics two, mathematics three, because it's a very different array of standards in those courses. But what our teachers have discovered is now with the stronger um, background and support that students are getting, that we definitely have a whole nother cohort of students that can take algebra, especially at the honors level in ninth grade, and absolutely without a problem continue on that path. 12th grade. The, the last and point I just want to ask a question on that. Yeah. So on the 12th grade, um, uh, the middle one, uh, honors yeah. level. Mm -hmm. So the uh, when they're in 12th grade, that this choice would be based on what they think they want to do in college. So you yeah, go with statistics if you're going to be in business. Right. Or right. I mean, that was another point that I was going to make that. Um, I mean, that would be a uh, data point that I would watch, and that's happening nationally. More that's and more students are absolutely absolutely accessing AP stats, depending on the career field that they want to go into. Um, so while I absolutely agree with some of the, the communities to keep watching that AP calculus, I wouldn't limit it to that in the future, but really look at those sort of 11th, 12th grade high-level courses. Um, just on this chart before you go to the next one, the... Mm -hmm. Um, so I know, uh, I think previously students could probably also access BC in the 11th grade, but um, I, I, th I don't know if this is exactly the same as the chart that we've seen previously. I know Trey you was have, out of yeah. Trey cool. yeah. 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 presented yeah. Yeah. with you like two, two years ago, um, and I think it's important to remember that students can move. So uh, my own children move between sort of levels. I mean, we did have the three levels, but they can, um, they, well, what would have been SCP, right to honors. Um, and so where you are in seventh grade doesn't define that path, and you can also sort of shift in high school. I think the right. most important thing for me as you look at this is students develop at different rates and paces. Mm -hmm. And so, and and the algebraic foundation is so important. The um, to All the colleges do, if you're going into engineering or the sciences, they do pre-assessments before you go in. And they don't care if you took, if you got a five on BC Calc. They want to know how well you knew algebra. Same and I think that's not the just science curriculums all. Right. Curriculum. right, but they, they're looking at, I know specifically, they look at the algebra preparedness. So, um, you know, I think that that's, it's important. And I just, so I don't know exactly, I know previously, maybe I thought there were other arrows on the chart or... Um, well, because yeah. before we had more options with, oh, with doubling the, up, with the doubling up or a summer, and now we're saying these right. are just okay. now our sample, probably right. most common sequences. Right. But no, that algebra one being the cornerstone or that yeah. foundation for everything else is yeah. absolutely true. And I think that's what we should feel the most good about. Not that there's still not work to be done, there is, but that we used to have an enormous attrition rate from students who completed Algebra yeah. 1, and now that attrition rate is really small. It, basically, we're saying if you have this successful Algebra 1 experience, you're now being able to move forward successfully, whether you're getting that in 8th grade or, ninth or in ninth grade. grade. And that and that's the goal. And that aligns with exactly what the state framework says to do mm -hmm. um, with that course. Which is one. Just on this chart, is, is it possible for students to move if, so Algebra 1, top row, green, yep. grade 9, geometry honors, can they move diagonally down the column, which would be moving up a level? And the same thing from geometry to Algebra 2 with trigonometry, is that yeah, gate so that's open one of the for students? I mean, questions, and I've talked to Mr. Skeen about that. For instance, a, another common question is, well, say um, you have math 8, 8th grade, and then you do extremely well, you go into honors algebra, but, you know, say by the time you're moving into 10th grade, you realize by whatever you want to do, you do want to get access to that BC calculus course. My understanding is that, of course, there guidance department and the math teachers, the math department would work with individual students and their families to see what's the path that will work best for you to do that. What other types of honors classes are you taking? Does it involve a summer class? Does it involve doubling up? Is there something that we can do? And so instead of, instead of saying there's one particular pathway that works for everyone, let's talk with those individual students to make that happen for them. But again, that's all being based on their success and their passion for that subject and what they want to do. So it's a yes yeah. if guidance says okay. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, and what that would look like for that student. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the last point that I wanted to make about this is uh, in the elementary um, staff that were here, the administrators sort of um, touched upon it, that in order for us, if we have the shared goal of trying to get as many students into Algebra 1 at the earliest point possible for them, that has to do with our pre-K to 6 curriculum. Uh, and so a lot of the work that we're doing, especially at K2, is about this number. And this is a slide that we showed at the math update, I think it was last year, last January. It was last year. Um, you know, some, some research, some studies that have been done about just how important. Some of the PD, three different consultants, you know, have confirmed with me that, yeah, it's probably very true that if we really wanted to, we could probably recognize or identify kids as early as third grade, which ones are probably really now going to struggle with accessing these courses in eighth grade or ninth grade because of the trouble with number sense. So as a system, we've been putting a lot of focus in those years at K-2, not only to, to get that very strong in our curriculum, but to implement timely interventions so that if they are struggling in second grade or third grade, they're getting the interventions there and not moving on to sixth grade with third grade struggles, mm -hmm. things like that. And so I think the staff's doing a great job with that. So that's a real mini math uh, update that we need. I know it's late. Very, very quick question on that. I I tend to agree with you that the right metric is how many kids are accessing AP. That's the yep. metric, is yep. are we increasing the number of kids who are accessing and succeeding at the highest level math we offer in the district. It would seem to me that another metric would be the percentage of kids in eighth grade who are qualifying for algebra. Sure. And I, my memory was that that number was increasing as well. Am I, is my memory It has. That? Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, it certainly isn't near what it used to be several years ago, but again, you know, even if we had a much higher, our attrition rate was so large before. Yeah. And so if, actually, if I had this to do over tonight, like I said, I would have included that number. Yeah. So you could compare mm -hmm. those two. But remember, to the yeah. Algebra 1 course is different now. Yeah, right. yeah. So Absolutely. it's a very different So the, number, yeah. the numbers of enrollment are going to be different for eighth grade. Totally. I mean, I mean there's another district, I won't say which one, but a very high-performing district that kind of experienced this whole shift in standards in a different way because they never had levels in math at their middle level. Everyone completed algebra in eighth grade. Well, as soon as the, st the standards shifted, mm -hmm. they realized this doesn't work anymore. Something That's not eligible anymore. anymore. Uh -huh. So it means for the first time, we have to actually create a separate group of students that will complete algebra one in eighth grade. And that caused because a huge community so change because now what's the right number of kids who can get in there? What's yeah? So it just shows that no matter what position you're coming at it, the change in standards sort of prompted a major challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So, Mr. Moore, I want to thank you for your service to the town. Oh, thank you. Um, I think this is your maybe your last Our update last to us. Yeah. 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 Oh, um, my goodness. Yeah. And and the um, just follow up on your point. You talked about K to five documents being in process, mm -hmm. right, for the curriculum for the math curriculum. Just for transitions, which we're planning for uh, going forward. Just a reminder, and maybe the superintendent can update us in the future on how how we'll handle this, but we do have developed K-8 to eight math curriculum documents as one of our focus areas by the end of next year. So we're halfway through these goals, so just you know, wh whatever you, you can give us on updated timelines uh, in a future update would be helpful. Thanks. I do I have several things. Sorry. Try to keep them short. Um, so, uh, as you know, and I did communicate out to the community as well, um, we did have to suspend the high school principal search. Uh, we did have one candidate. Um, the candidate did withdraw um, to pursue other opportunities. Um, the I do want to give a little bit of feedback that that I received. Um, in conversations that I had with this candidate throughout the process that I think were some determining factors. Uh, one, one piece uh, is that the candidate felt that the skill set that she had um, was a better fit to the needs of another district. So, I mean, that, that certainly is a legitimate piece. But in conversations that I had had with this candidate um, in some of the interviews, the one-on-one -on -one interviews and follow-up interviews, is that the uncertainty of the community right now was a determining factor, um, most notably the override. 
and that there was some real concern about that, which also my guess is would be pause for other candidates that would want at this time to look at applying to Reading because of the uncertainty. So given that information, um, we, you know, we decided that we're going to right now wait um, a couple of weeks, reopen the search. At the same time, I'm simultaneously looking at uh, interim candidates um, for, that would be for one year. Um, so I'm looking at different options there uh, to see where, where we're going to be able to find the best, the best match. So there'll be more information as we go forward, but I, I wanted to update the committee on that. Uh, the other search that we're working on is the assistant superintendent search. I do want to thank the following people for being on the committee. Um, it's being facilitated by Jen Bove, who you know, our uh, human resource administrator. Uh, Gail and Carolyn are on it. Uh, Heather Leonard, Rochelle Shanklin um, are our principals that are on it. Um, and then elementary teachers, Heather Murphy from Barrow, Stephanie Malone from Wood End, Laura Warren from Coolidge, and we have three parents. Lauren Ream is a high school parent, Peggy McElhaney, who is a, actually a preschool parent, uh, and Brian Snell, who is a high school parent. So that committee um, met today. Uh, actually, they've met a few times, but today they conducted um, some interviews. Uh, we had over 30 applicants for the job. Um, for the position uh, today, they interviewed several candidates from that 30. Um, they handed over to me some pre-finalists, and what I will be doing now is interviewing those pre-finalists and checking references based on the feedback that they gave me, the committee gave me, on additional questions they wanted me to ask these pre-finalists, and then based on that, I will move forward um, some finalists will have some site visits and open microphone sessions early next week. And we are still on track for me giving a recommendation to the school committee next Wednesday. Um, if for some reason that changes, we have snowstorms or something like that, <laughs> which we seem to have every few days now, um, you know, that may delay the timeline process. But that's where we're at right now with the assistant superintendent search. Um, I don't want to go into a lot of detail. I've got several good items that have been highlighted in the in my newsletters over the last couple of weeks and most notably uh, we've had several high school and middle school art award recipients which have been highlighted. Our uh, high school jazz band um, has done very well. Um, yesterday they did uh, perform at the States. Um, I do not have the results of those. I, because I was in interviews all day today, I didn't get a chance to talk to Mr. Mulligan. Um, since we last met, I believe the Science Olympiad team uh, won the States, and they're going to go to Nationals in May at Colorado State University. Um, our robotics team competed here with thir against with 39 other teams this weekend right here at Reading Memorial High School. Um, they won the Entrepreneurship Award, um, which is something that you have to apply for. It's one of those awards you apply for, and you have to develop uh, a well rounded business plan which you submit and um, so they won that award out of the 40 recipients. Um, so there's a lot of good things that are that are going on and those are all being those are all being highlighted. Um, you also may have seen an article in the Chronicle about the um, the teachers that have completed all four uh, courses of the trauma course, and Carolyn talked about that. I believe it was the last meeting. Yeah. Um, so that that's going to be in my next newsletter. Um, and so you know, again, I want to I want to congratulate those teachers um, who've now done all four. We're going to continue to offer those those different phases of the, of the courses. Um, we are continuing our Alice drills. Um, several schools have now done Alice drills. There's a few more schools that need to complete them this month, but by the end of the month, everyone will have done um, another round of Alice drills, and the high school has a second one scheduled, I believe, for April. 
Um, you also may have noticed in my newsletter, uh, I did an update on the uh, walkout that happened. Um, because of the snowstorm, it wasn't uh, when the rest of the country did it, which was uh, supposed to be on Wednesday. So Coolidge had an, an assembly on Thursday, and Parker and the high school had theirs on uh, Friday. Parker's did theirs um, in their auditorium, and Coolidge, I'm sorry, the high school did theirs outside. Um, about, I would say, half the students participated in the high school. I attended the high school one. Um, about half the students participated in the high school one, and about 400 of the 600 students participated at Parker's. All of these are, were student-driven, student-led. Um, the role of teachers, the role of administrators was to provide a safe environment for, for these assemblies to occur. Um, there were students that chose to stay in their classrooms and there were teacher supervision um, in those classrooms as well. So I want to I wanna thank the students for the role that they played in this and planning it. Um, I want to thank the administration and the staff and the Reading Police Department for providing the, the um, supervision and structure to allow this to happen. Again, I want to emphasize that this was all student-led and student-driven. Administrators were not involved in the planning of this at all, other than to make sure that it was a safe environment for the kids who participated. So that's everything I got. I just would like to um, thank Dr. Darty for his participation at the Coolidge. I know he attended the Science Olympiad and was a judge, spent most of this weekend judging the robotics competition. And so that's just, these events can't happen without support of a lot of volunteers. And just want to acknowledge that. Anything else? Yeah, motion. Oh, motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Sure. Oh, yeah. Six, 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 six. Yeah, we almost